and and bam, we're live. Damn, I think I'm going to be fidgeting with this mic a lot today. Can you guys hear me? Anthony, what's up? Good morning, brother. Anthony Lewis. Yeah, this is going to be crazy, right? I was just on uh, my unbanned Instagram account, Sevon Rinsta, S-E-V-A-N-R-I-N-S-T-A, I think, Rinsta, Sevon Rinsta, um, trying to get people to come over here. I don't even know how to describe Heath Pedigo, this guy who's about to come on. But if you don't know who he is, his name is Heath Pedigo, P-E-D-I-G-O. I should actually write it in the comments. And you want to Google him and you want to start watching the series on YouTube and you want to watch it with your kids. Good morning, Bruce. And you want to uh, watch it with your kids and it's called um, Daisy Fresh, an American Jiu-Jitsu Story. It is incredible. Will Hobart be, Hobart be on? What, what, good morning, Ruben. No, it's just me and Heath. Heath Pedigo. If he shows up, I always, you know, if he shows up. Yes, I can hear you. Thanks, Valerie. Valerie Zika? Zika? Do you remember when before, uh, before they tried to get Zika to stick before the uh, this current joke that, they're, that they've got us running around doing circles with? So I was just uh, complaining this morning, not complaining, critiquing. This is a notebook I have. It's where I do all my, keep all my notes. And I go through a notebook about every 30 uh, guests. And this notebook I have to stand on to keep the pages open. So every time I turn the page, I have to put it on the ground and literally stand on it so it stays open, right? So the crease stays there. Can you imagine making a notebook that didn't stay open on its own, unless there's some reason for that. It, it seems like complete idiocy and a fail. Like someone should be just taken out back and like slapped around for that. It's like my kids' shirts. My kids' shirts, the opening at the top of them, 90% of them, it hurts them when you pull it over their head because uh, their heads are bigger than the opening of the shirt. Who would do that to kids? Who? Hello from Nikita and baby Casey. Excited for this one. Awesome. Thanks, Maria. It's weird. It's weird that I didn't know about this guy sooner. You know, I just found out about these Daisy Fresh guys, I don't know, a week ago. I feel like I'm late to the game. But I watched the uh, five part. Are there more than five parts? Does anyone know if there's more than five parts to that documentary series? Once again, let me tell you guys the name of it. It's called Daisy Fresh, an American Jiu-Jitsu Story. And it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a show that you should watch with your kids, I think. The whole family should watch it. It's an amazing story. Good morning, Ron. You need to interview the Hillbilly Hammer. I agree. I need to go through all those guys. I need, to I need to interview those guys and make $20 off of each one of them on my YouTube channel. Interview jiu-jitsu guys to pay for my kids' jiu-jitsu. I, I just love that. So many questions for this guy, Heath. I hope I don't screw it up. I was just talking on... Um, my Instagram live. This is, I don't know why I'm so nervous about this one. I feel like I'm going to say something um, that I'm going to accidentally pretend like I know more than I do. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to get schooled. I, 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 but I, I want to get schooled, but I don't want to be, I don't want to be, uh, um, I want to get schooled. I want to be humble about it. I don't want to say something and he has to unfuck me. Because, you know, I don't do jujitsu. I just take, the, drive the kids there five days a week. So I think I know everything, but I know nothing. What's up, Clay? How are you? I wonder if we're going to get this guy on. Should we call Matt Souza? We're four minutes into the live show, and we do not have our guest. Isn't it amazing, this miracle of, like, I can just be sitting here in my office, computer, microphone? This stuff's not even that expensive. If you're committed to doing a show, you can do the show. How many shows is this? This is show 155, and I need to get to show 500. I was, I've been a little bit down on myself. Not down. That's too strong. But when I don't do the big, big CrossFitters, the numbers on the show drop. But I, but I don't want to rely on that. So, like, I'm, I'm really just interviewing who I want to interview. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Matthew good morning. Souza. You are live on the air. Can you tell oh, us do you, any, any thoughts on where the guest is? No, I tried. I sent them a message through Instagram. I re-emailed them right now, and I'm going to send them another one to see where the hell he's at. 
Okay, thank you. All right, stand by. All right, no problem. Okay. There's bye. only 17 people listening. <laughs> That's more than all my podcasts got combined. So awesome. <laughs> you sound a bit low. No, no, I'm not low. I'm not low. I'm not low. It, I'm, not, I'm not low. Sorry, I didn't make it seem like that. I am really excited. Here, let me tell you how excited I am. This is how stupid emotions are. This is why you got to keep that shit in check. So this morning, I'm looking at the numbers, and I'm like, oh, when I don't, when I don't have big, big time CrossFitters on, the numbers for the show drop. Right? Like, who gives a shit? I'm still doing what I want to do. The numbers are still great. Um, people, the comments are fantastic. I should be happy. But you know, I'm just like kicking myself because like, I, I, I want to take over. I want to take over. I want to have everyone on. I want to have Biden and Trump on. I want to host the debate. I want to be better than that other guy, Mr. Rogan. And, but, so, so I'm kicking myself and I'm like, you know, you just stay, stay the course for two more years, Sevon. Keep your head down. Who gives a shit, right? Everyone wants to be the best at what they do. And I'm putting in the work. But then out of nowhere, Alexander Volkanovsky, I don't know if you guys know who that is. He returned my DM this morning and said he'd love to come on the podcast. So how could I, how could I, it's like complaining about your penis when it's 10 inches long. It's like, you're just being a baby. You're just being a baby. I'm just being a baby. You just, you just, you just want to do better. You just want to do better. The numbers will start picking up for non-crossfit guests. I agree, Ron. Thank you. Yeah, wouldn't it be great? I'm really curious to hear Volkanovsky's story. Uh, he's got an, uh, obviously he's got an amazing weight loss story, but to uh, come from Australia and I, and I just love his message. Hey, if I can do it, anyone can do it. It's hard to believe that someone who is um, puts on performances like him. But uh, yeah, Andy, and it, the, the other weird part is too is that he beat Max Holloway, who I I don't know who doesn't love Max Holloway. But, but Volkanovsky, I feel like uh, Brian Ortega made it easier to like Alexander Volkanovsky after this last weekend's fight. For those of you who aren't following, I'm a big fan of the UFC. It's the ultimate fighting championships. And it plays um, basically every Saturday. And this last Saturday, they had a championship match against Brian Ortega and Alexander Volkanovsky. And here is Alexander Volkanovsky with a freshly clean haircut. There he is. There he is. Yeah. Man, it's great. Oh, no, wait. This is Heath Pettigo. It is Soon not Heath Pettigo. Pettigo. Okay. Who? Soon to be. I'm, I'm George. I'm just getting Heath, uh, helping him to get set up right now with some headphones. George, you got the uh, same haircut. Oh, yeah, I'm the brown Heath Pettigo. Wait, George, can you, can you move back from the camera for a second? Oh, my goodness, people. A little bit. Can you put the camera down so we can see your torso? See this body? <laughs> this is the guy, guys. This is we're live on my YouTube station. We've been live for eight minutes. This is one of the guys I've been telling you about who's in that documentary that you gotta see. This is the guy. How are you? Wow. Good man, good man. We're just getting getting heat set up here for you guys. It's a twofer. It's a twofer. <laughs> two two guys, one podcast. How are how are you? Where are you guys? Good. We're uh Heath's house right now, actually. And uh, I, I didn't know you made that. You're that's awfully domesticated. You go to Heath's house. Yeah, I live in in the van, and then I just kind of like I sleep outside the gym, and then I'll sleep outside. Heath's here. I'll crash on his couch sometimes. I'll go and sleep at Alejandro's, just kind of wherever. I got to get some work done. Living the dream. How is everything? Can you believe this is your life? No, dude, it's very surreal sometimes. It feels like a like the movie Peter Pan. It feels like uh, we're living in Neverland, and Heath is Peter Pan, and we're just the Lost Boys over here. That's what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great movie. Those are two great movies, Peter Pan and Lost Boys. Yeah. Do you have any? Do you have any vampires in the gym? Um, we actually have a mania visit. That I'm pretty sure he was a vampire. He sounded like one. <laughs> All right. Uh... What's your Instagram handle? It is at, at gorgeous George. Of course. <laughs> of course. Have you ever seen the movie Snatch? Uh yeah, but I didn't hear I didn't understand one thing that was said in that movie. <laughs> I just watch it for the fight scenes. Is it is it the gorgeous George? Um just that at looks like Okay, because that looks like a porn. 
Right. <laughs> yeah, oh, is it, is it is it is it gorgeous Jorge or gorgeous George? Gorgeous Jorge. Okay, okay. I see it. Gorgeous Jorge. Do you have a dog as your uh, profile picture? That's that's not it. That's actually the, a different one. Another gorgeous Jorge. Yeah, I bet you I spelled. Dog. You want to try to get that one? I bet you I spelled gorgeous wrong. So will someone will someone in the comments here on the on the YouTube stream type in uh, at gorgeous Jorge and see if we can get this guy's Instagram handle? You really have to follow all of these guys. This is some fun shit. This is what what reality TV show should have been. This is what real life activism looks like. Not protesting in front of like in front of uh, government buildings wanting change. This is like people really making a change. Being the mere being the it's the Gandhi shit. These boys, this guy, they're doing the stuff. They're being the change they want to see in the world. I can't wait to dig in with you guys. All right, brother. Heath is ready for you here. Oh, okay, yeah. George, I'm going to uh, – Jorge, Yeah. I'm going to um, bug you soon too and try to get you on the show. No doubt, man. Whatever you need. Whatever you You're need. You're man. Thank you. Thank you. What's going on, brother? <laughs> You're making them all get the haircut now? Or they yeah, made, or yeah. they made you get the haircut. Well, I, mean, I just feel so old sometimes, man. It's just you know, if, if I can get them to all look alike, it makes me feel better. Last night I was going through some of your podcasts, and I was, um, I was there's some really bad audio in some of them, and some bad camera angles, and I can't tell you how happy I am to see you with this like straightforward angle. I could hear your voice. We got a special treat with George. You prepped yeah. us with George. You lubed us up with George. A little foreplay with George. That was no, they, great. They, they'll, they'll stop by. They, uh, you, you'll probably see a couple of them here. They, they, they all, they all run, run in and out. So. I, 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 I hang. I, I know a lot of big name people. I can't believe how starstruck I am just sitting here staring at you. You know what I did in the last two days? I just watched um, episodes one through five. I'm going to tell you guys again. It's the Daisy Fresh, an American Jiu Jitsu story. It's about uh, this gentleman that you're looking at, Heath. Pedigo. It's about his project um, and his passion and his giving back to the world. I don't know if you would call him a martial artist, a humanitarian, a father, uh, a, a, a real activist, like someone who's actually he's not he's not holding signs and protesting. He's actually being the change. He's setting people up for success in this world. It's um, it's so crazy refreshing. Anyway, I would just watched all five. Are there more than five episodes, Heath? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple more actually. Uh, I think I think there's three more that that are on Apple that they haven't released yet. They just kind of slowly release them to YouTube. Uh, so so uh, that I'll want to subscribe to Flow Grappling yeah, to get. Yeah. Oh, okay, I, that makes sense. They got to make money. But yeah, yeah. I ain't hating. Yeah, no, we we were really excited that they put those out on YouTube. You know what I mean? Because uh, nothing was out at all. So when when they dropped those, you know, because they're they're so much different than the other. Uh, you know, they're not even really about jujitsu. You know what I mean? That, like, like you said, I, I consider myself a, a, a jujitsu guy. I always, I just tell them I'm, a, I'm, you know, an activist in the jujitsu revolution. That's what I always tell people. So it's like uh, just about trying to get change. And that show is, uh, it's about so much more than you know, just training and uh, sleeping on the mats. It's, it's, it, there's so much more to it than that. So it's, uh, you know, I, I was really excited when they put it on YouTube. That way, everybody could check it out and, you know get something out of it um where were you born um uh, mount vernon you're uh, born there born and raised here a little town there's about fourteen thousand people here it's uh yeah right right in the middle of uh the illinois on the bottom the closest uh cities uh st louis is about uh, a couple hours away that's the closest biggest thing uh yeah that, there, there's there's nothing else within an hour of it at all so it's just a small place in the middle of nowhere so for those of you who don't know, Mount Vernon is in Illinois, and um, for those of you who don't know, Illinois is in the United States, and those of you who don't know, I think it's pretty much right in the middle. It sounds like when he told me just now where it's at, I was thinking it's probably south of Chicago by 500 miles. Is that? Yeah, exactly. We're about four hours south of Chicago. We're actually closer to like, uh, closer to like Memphis, Tennessee, Louisville. When, when you're from Illinois, no matter where you're from, when you tell someone – yeah, I know I'm from Mount Vernon, way, way far away from Chicago. Then when they introduce you, they'll say, no, this is TV from Chicago. They never, uh, you know, if you're from Illinois, people just assume you're from Chicago. But uh, where are you from? I'm in, I'm in Cal. I was born in Oakland, California. 
born and raised. Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a born and uh, die hard fucking super liberal woke as can be, and I'm 49 years old. And finally, about five or six years ago, something happened to me. Someone gave me the red pill, and I woke up and I realized, holy shit! But I lived a pretty crazy life too. I spent years homeless on the streets, but I worked my ass off, and I wasn't a drug addict like all my colleagues. All my my peer group was all drug addicts. I was disciplined, like you're giving those boys. Yeah, no, no, I understand that. So the best way for 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 people in California to understand it, Mount Vernon would be like Stockton. That's kind of what it would be like. Ooh, ooh. Like if you went to the worst worst part of Stockton, that's what Mount Vernon is like. It's uh, not that it's a bad place. There's like one road that runs through the middle of the town. On one side of the road, it's uh, it's rough. On the other side, it's just a normal Midwest town. It's all right place. It's all right place. It just uh, breeds tough people, you know. You're um, you're 39 years old. I mean, you know, you have to say all that shit on here, but you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, I went to. I think you have a wiki page. I think you were born 10 years after me. I think I saw like when you were born, and I was like, oh, he's born in 10 years after me. I'm 38. 38. All right. And um, and so you're born and raised in Mount Vernon, Illinois. And have you ever left? Yeah. Yeah. So I. Uh... I was uh, 15 years back in the day called Full Contact Fighter. It was actually a newspaper uh, um, news thing that went out, like a magazine kind of. It was like a newspaper form, and it would go out uh, in, in the 90s, and you, you could get a subscription to them, and one would come a month. So uh, I would write all the people. They would put their names and the addresses of their gyms at the bottom. So I would write every person that was in there. Uh, I, I was just training in the grass at the time with my brother. We'd buy VCR tapes, and we would just roll around in the grass and get any of the kids in the hood that, that I would then to come over and train with us and uh, uh, go to the power of the gyms and try to get those guys. But uh, uh, one time, a guy finally wrote me back, and he said I could come out for the summer. If, uh, if my parents could pay for the plane ticket, he would take care of all the food, and I could live with him. His name was Eugene Jackson. And he lived in Palo Alto, California, so not not too too far from you up there. That wow, was, yeah. yeah. So that was very close first. to me, very close to me, thirty minute drive. Yeah, so I was really excited when he wrote. I was like, man, it's going to be Pamela Anderson, you know, on the beach and all this stuff. It's California. And then when I got up there, I looked up Palo Alto on the internet. It was like Stanford University and all this amazing, amazing shit. And then when I got there, East Palo Alto was a little bit different. It was more like Mount Vernon. So. uh they told me, look, you can't go outside after 5 p.m. here, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, it gets a little rough. There's light gangbanging going on. But so I just stayed in the gym the whole time. I just like I just spent every second in the gym training out there. Uh, it was a like, called Gladiator Training Academy. There was a couple guys from the UFC, Eugene Jackson and Tim Lasick. And uh, Mark Court was there at the time. He was like 17 or 18 years old. He was a couple years older than me. And uh, that, that was my. That was my first like eye opening experience, getting to go somewhere and train and, you know, do jujitsu with other people and like, you know, just uh, see the world outside of Mount Vernon. So then for the rest of my, uh, for the next several years in high school, I, I never, uh, I never stayed around for summer. I left for the whole uh, three months and I would go out to California and uh, sleep on the mats uh, wherever I could and stay there. Do you know Garth Taylor by any chance? The country singer? Uh, no, that, that was good though. Garth Taylor, that's that's where my kids go. Garth Taylor Jiu Jitsu, uh, here in. Uh, yeah, I, I do, I do. I know he, I know it's. I don't know personally, but I, I, I've seen them. Uh, I've seen them on there. He he's fifty now. I th- I, I want to say he was one of the first whiteies to go down to Brazil and win a title. I know. Yeah, yeah. I normally I would just spout off what it what it what his accolades are, but that's because I don't normally talk to anyone as knowledgeable or as deep in the community as you. So I feel like confident being like cocky about it. But with someone like you, I'm totally neutered. No, no, so bear I think, with I me. Th- 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 there's a big group of guys. There's like of uh, uh, dudes that, that that like you know like really really black belts that went down, and I think that my, his name was one of the names that were on there. Uh, it's a uh, I don't remember. Wait, is he in Santa Cruz? Maybe something like that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Say say that again. You guys know of each other? Yeah, yeah. No, it, there, there's a, like I said, there was a big group of them, uh, uh, like just really early, early guys that were were running around and got black belts. You know, they went down when they were like blue belt or something. They went down to Brazil and stayed, and then they all came. Eddie from on the math, I think he was. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, all kind of part of that crew. Yeah. So, so that was. Yes. 
training. Uh, I, I started in 93. I saw the first UFC, me and my brother. My dad was actually like a took bet. He was uh, so I don't know if you remember. Uh, well, you weren't even born. Yeah, yeah. You, you're just coming out. But um, they used to have these little black boxes and you would take these. Uh, it was like the first fire stick. You would put it on behind the black box and then you could get all the pay-per-view stuff. So uh, yes, yes. My, my dad had got one and we actually watched the first UFC live because he was deciding whether, hey, do I want to take bets on this thing? We saw Hoist on there. and uh, It's kind of funny. You the, Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry. Hold on one second. Your dad was a bookie. Say that again. Well, that's that, that, that's allegedly that's that's not, you said that I just said that. <laughs> you can't take bets or not. But uh, okay, no. So uh, yeah, he, he uh, so we watch all the sports. We had several TVs in the house. There's a lot of sports going on, and uh, that was the first one he was really big into boxing. You know, those were the Mike Tyson times. So you know that was like a you know, probably the greatest time. Of boxing, you know, of Vander Holyfield, Lynch Lewis, and it was it was just like a a, a, a wonderful. And sports all together, you know, the Dallas Cowboys had those huge teams and they were, you know, amazing. And Michael Jordan, I don't know, you know, was a, not that they're not incredible now, but those were just really great times, you know what I mean? For yep, sports, yep. You know? And uh, sports fans were different then too, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, now it's it's more about like putting your team on your, your Facebook profile. But back then, you know, people were like driving like 10 hours and sleeping outside to get tickets, you know, a week before. I don't know. T- just different times, I guess. I don't know, but maybe it's the same, you know, but uh, things are just a little bit easier now, I think, when it comes to, you know, being, being a fan of something. It's easier to support something by just, uh, you know, talking about it on social media rather than, you know, getting out and you know, putting your feet on the ground. And I don't know, it is what it is, but. Guys, if you're, just tu- if you're just tuning in now, this is Heath Pedigo. Heath, not health, like your computer is going to want to autocorrect it. Heath. Pedigo, P-E-D-I-G-O. You should look him up. And more importantly than than Humble Heath, you should look up this documentary. Uh, it's on YouTube now. Not all the parts, but the first five parts. I just watched it with my uh, two four-year-old sons and my six-year-old son. They were completely – I was actually surprised at how into it they were. Um, I It's called uh, Daisy Fresh, an American Jiu-Jitsu Tale or Story. Just type in Daisy Fresh, an American, and it will pop up. You will want to watch this, um, whether you're into jiu-jitsu, whether you're into fighting, whether you're into it, – it's a, it's a – it covers every base, this story. It's a, it's a story about young men. It's a, it's a modern-day um, coming of age. It's everything. It's, it's, a, it's, 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 like, it's like the Lost Boys but without vampires. It's good shit, man. It is really – and you'll leave watching this movie believing in yourself and believing a little bit more in uh, humanity and what – how good people behave and what they can do. Uh, Heath, so, so you're 15 years old. I, I want to go back a little bit younger than that. Um, to, and I did see your interview about that, about how you went to that seminar when you were 15 and you paid $150 and it was shit. And that kind of made you um, never want to do a shit seminar. And by the way, I really uh, admire that. Um, so you're eight years old or nine years old and you watch UFC 1? Is yeah, that? We, I, was, I was 10 and we watched, I think it was in November of if I remember right. And, uh, as soon as I saw it, it's kind of funny. Uh, everybody else who kind of talks about when they got to jiu-jitsu and they saw Hoist Gracie, uh, they, they, they always, in their mind, they say, oh, you know, I saw this little skinny guy. But the way I saw it was I saw this huge, gangly, giant guy that was uh, slow. And I thought, man, if someone would just learn how to wrestle and sprawl, they could just punch him and they could just beat him up. So uh, it was kind of the opposite of what everybody else thought. No, he, he, he was amazing, you know, a huge pioneer for us. And uh, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way towards him, but that's the way that I saw it. I just thought, man, you could be a contender in this if you could just wrestle and keep, keep it on your feet and you could punch the guys. And, uh, you know, we, we did that being from the Midwest. My brother wrestled, uh, you know what I mean? Everyone kind of wrestles. Even if they don't, they wrestled in high school. You know what I mean? So it's like everybody just kind of has that like gritty, uh, you know, if they didn't wrestle, their brother or their cousin wrestled and beat the shit out of them all the time. So everybody knows about wrestling. You know what I mean? And uh, How old's your brother? Is he older or younger? He's like 150 years old. He's he, he, he's what he's failed. If anyone's a vampire, that would be him. He's like since he was 20. Uh, he, he's 40, 45, 46. So, uh, so he was a lot he was older than me. It doesn't sound like that much now, but you know, when you're kids, when you're uh, 
when you're 12 and they're 20, that means ass whoopings every day. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, and he's a big guy. He's like a really big, strong, you know, uh, if, if he was four inches bigger, he could have played in the NFL, one of those type dudes. He's like a complete physical specimen. So everyone that he would bring over, he would meet at the like weightlifting gym. So all the guys that I would practice on were these big, like heavy hitting, like 500 pound bench press guys. So I was constantly on bottom. And we actually didn't just do regular jujitsu. We, uh, we, we did like a uh, Valley Tudo, like no holds barred every time. So there was no head butting, but everything else we, that they would punch. And so they would just constantly like, get on top of me and just beat the shit out of me. They would punch me and uh, slam me. And we were in the grass. So, uh, so we were training for the, for the UFC basically at the time, you know, it's kind of funny because when people say now like, Oh, I train UFC, but in our mind, it's kind of like what we were doing. You know, we, we didn't have a coach. We didn't have, um, I had a couple of books that I would buy them and save up all the money I could. And then, uh, I would, I would get VC tapes. And, um, most of the times they were in uh, por- Portuguese or the, my favorite ones were always in Japanese. So I never knew what the hell they were saying, but I would just pause, rewind. And then the fucking VCR would eat the tape and I'd have to get, out and fix it but that was pretty much uh my life from 10 to uh like 17 was just watching vcr tapes and then uh anytime that i could ever go anywhere and train i would like go and uh i always tell the guys now uh when i was there so it's like if you had me to your gym it's like garth where your kids go and have me to his gym i would hide in the corner and i would clean not only everything that i did but everything everyone else did so it's like i would make sure that no one knew i was there that way i could never wear up my work you know, I would just clean up after everyone else all the time. I just always thought, thought you know, like, hey, that's the least that the least that you could do is just, uh, you know what I mean, just keep everything clean. So, you know, I, I wanted to stay there. I just wanted someone to ask me, hey, stay here permanently. And uh, Dan from Tap Out, the guy who owns Tap Out Clothing, Dan Caldwell, uh, punk ass, he uh, actually, when I was uh, 16, he actually kind of told me, uh, I mean, they didn't say drop out of school, but said, Look, you're out here in California with us. I was sleeping in couch at the time uh and i think they had like maybe one maybe a two bedroom at the biggest he had five kids and uh i was sleeping on the couch and like his his kids were like sleep on the, the couch with me and they were selling the t-shirts out of the trunk still it's like uh him and charles uh and uh he told me man just move out here and uh you know they, they were um they were ex-cops at a, a indian reservation uh sam Manuel was the name of it and uh they told me man just dude move out here and just be a part of this and my mom was a school teacher and she told me, look, you know, you can't do that. You got to finish school. And, you know, the old, yeah, you got to go to school and you got to go to college to be successful. You know? And you know, that, that's all she ever knew. So, yep. Um, yep. Sounds like my parents. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, so I, they, they wanted me to take that route and then I kind of passed. And I think, I think everyone from Tap Out just all sold their, their, their pieces of that front, all like 10 million each. So I, I missed the boat on that one. But uh, those, those guys were really, uh, I mean, they, they were really good. You know, while I was out there, they, they, they took me around to train at a lot of different places. I mean, a guy named Scott Prophet that was out there, and uh, they um, I, that, that was the second uh, year that I came out. So I was uh, out around, like, the San Bernardino California area, and uh, I got to train at a lot of gyms and get a lot of different looks, uh, you know, and, and uh, that was kind of the first time that I, you know, they, they said, hey, this is a gi gym, so I had got a gi and put it on. And then I realized I didn't know shit all over again. And I needed to start all over, so that was really. Uh, wait, wait, say, say, go back to that. When was the first gym you had a gi at? S- say that you were sixteen, and which gym was that? Uh, Pedro Carvalho, I think, was the first, the first, uh, the first guy that I'd ever put the gi on at his gym. He had a gym in Rancho Cucamonga, California, and that's, that's yeah, that's yeah. Where, that's where and all the guys I trained at, so uh, they was uh, you can come over here and get this. See, here, they all they all just stopped by here. Look. at uh, you know what? I actually can't see you for some reason on your end. Um, the video drop. Can you still see me? I haven't been able to see you since the beginning of the show. Yeah, yeah, it breaks my heart. You. Okay. You want, you want me to have one of the boys? But I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm slow when it comes to this stuff. So they got to set it up. George, George will come look at this. So uh, if it's up. okay. I, I'm sure it has to do with the software I'm using. There he is. Man, people, as soon as I told people I was having you on, Heath, people were wanting this hillbilly on. So many DMs pouring in. Get the hillbilly on. There he is. There he is. Ask, isn't the world magical? People just want to see him, and there he is. They yeah, just hey, they, uh, they get their wish. If you have a vision, it's truly you really have it. You know what I mean? Sometimes you can just uh, you can accomplish that. I think by you know make it happen, physically make it happen. So I think uh, 
it worked in this case. I don't know. I've been doing it trying to win a lottery, but that shit. <laughs> but we'll, uh, you know, vision on it. So. This this documentary, um, Daisy Fresh, an American Jiu Jitsu story. Watch it on YouTube. Uh, all three of the gentlemen who you've seen on this podcast are in the show. There's something about it that I really like, and um, it's just it's real. Oh, everyone says everything's real. Fuck you, Savon. No, I'm serious. Like the, even the I, I wonder what they left on the cutting room floor because this is really raw and authentic, and the this is what young men are really like. They've, in the first five episodes, you see pretty much exactly how young men really are, except you don't see a lot of women in there. And that, and, and I am curious how how they manage the women thing. But this is a um, this is some authentic shit. These are boys who are bonding. If you don't give boys something to do, like Heath is giving these boys something to do, boys will do bad shit. Boy, men between the age of sixteen and thirty five need to be kept busy, people. And if you don't. You you are you're 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 creating havoc for all of society, not just for the boys, for all of civilization. Many and, and it's 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 fascinating seeing how hard if you let people if you give people the space and the love and the belief in them and you give them a good peer group and and a, and a lot of healthy peer pressure, this is what happens. It's yeah, so, so cool, so, so cool. You, you, yes, you 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 really you really hit the the nail uh, the, the the head on that man. It's like uh, so me when I was around that age, like young fifteen. I was meaner than fuck. I was like uh, the opposite of everything that, that like I, I stand for now and that I want. Everything that you just said, all positive stuff, idle hands, man. Like when I was young, I was like, uh, you know, we had like a little youth street gang that I was in and we'd run around and we just would terrorize, man. We were like mean. And when I didn't have the jiu-jitsu stuff, before I was like just completely obsessed with right around like uh, 14, 15, I know you're thinking like, what could a kid from 10 to 13 do? Uh, they can do a lot of wild shit. You know what I mean? It's like just neighborhood kids. But the, Like the, what? The, like shooting dogs with BB guns and breaking windows and sitting on the side of the street and like tying trash cans to the backs of cars and then watching them drive away? Just shit like that or even yeah, crazier yeah. shit? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, neighbor guys have you deliver packages on your bikes and giving you 500 bucks. And, uh, right. Uh, Finding finding guns out in the weeds that people had uh, shot people with and dropped, and uh, you know, you know, just wild. Mount Vernon's a wild place, man. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a it, there's a lot of poverty, and in, uh, in, I grew up in that uh, in that area. We uh, in the school that I went to, they they find asbestos in the school, and uh, it was on Monday. They announced, hey, there's not going to school anymore, and there were probably like there were probably like seven or eight white kids, and the rest of the, the rest of the school was black, and. Uh, they said, hey, there's asbestos in the school. On Tuesday, they tore the school down. It was completely gone, the whole thing. So I can't oh. Yeah, it was like, who knows? Maybe that's why I'm so nuts now. But uh, it was like, that, that, that's what I'm saying. You know, in, in those types of neighborhoods, it's like, um, you know, and we didn't leave when I was a kid. Like, uh, we, we didn't, you don't leave the neighborhood. You know, you kind of didn't go to the other side of town, which I know that, sound, that sounds crazy in such a, uh, you know, in such a small place. But, uh, you know, you, you just... When, when you grow up and you don't know any different, you know, it's uh, like, like you said, idle hands. That really is true, especially with like young, young men, man, you know, and it's uh, uh, most of the girls that I went to school with at, at, at that age, you know, that they, they were pregnant when they were, uh, you know, 14, 15. And uh, all my friends that like lived on my block, now they're like, uh, they're dead or they're, they're, you know, they're doing like long prison sentences. Some of them are just now starting to get out. And it, uh, the bigger that the show got and the bigger that the gym, the jiu-jitsu got, I would, I would hit the opposite from uh, the community that I grew up in. It was more like, oh, you're, you're a sellout. You're a, you know what I mean? It's like instead of being happy and saying, hey, man, you know, like, yep, and, love yep. and, and it's not like anymore. It's like, uh, you know, because I still get involved. I still go down there and, you know, like because now they have kids, you know what I mean? And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the guys that I grew up with, they're not really in their kids' lives. But, uh, they, uh, you know, I just get down there and like you know just uh you know link up with everyone in that community and get them involved in the gym and uh yeah for a long time though man at, at that, that that community kind of gave me the oh you know that was kind of the you know, to, to to leave and go somewhere else and you know uh you know you're not down when, you know in the hood sometimes it's not the guy who makes and is, is a surgeon or a doctor that's not the person that people have respect for but the guy who banging and selling dope on the corner that has you know the, the cars and the money that's who gets the clout sometimes for the kids you know it's really it's true 
And uh, when you grow up like that, you don't want to be, um, you don't want to be a doctor, you know, or a, a teacher, someone who's going to give back an amazing shit to the community. And, uh, you know, you, you want to be the person who has the most street credit. And unfortunately, that's never usually a good thing, you know what I mean? But uh, so, you know, it's a, you got to find the balance in between those two things. And, uh, you know, so I just try to get down there still, like I said, and uh, actually, uh, I passed out flyers uh, a couple of years ago for the gym. I said, anyone that lived from this street to this street can train for free. And I would wow. constantly, constantly go down there and actually not one person showed up for a year. Not one. I couldn't get anyone to come. And then finally started coming in. And we had a really, right before COVID, we had a really killer kids program. And we were, I like to get them about, uh, so, so you got to get these kids that are really rough, man. You got to get them before 12. Like when, when I was 12, we was we were already kind of set and doing the things that we were doing. You know, you kind of, you look up to the people you look up to. So right around that nine, 10 age, man, if you can get them there, you can really make a really big difference. And uh, not that you can't when they're 12. That's not what I'm saying. It's just a little bit younger, you, know, you, you can really make changes and, you know, you can change lives. And, uh, you know, if their friends see them doing, everyone just wants to be a part of something. You know what I mean? And right at, right at that age, they're, they're, to either, they're, they're ready to be loyal to anything, whether it's gang banging, selling dope, uh, uh, being a policeman, being a part of a team, you know, being part of community, whatever it is, they're ready. They just want someone to love them and they want to be loyal to something. And, uh, you know, it's, I think it's an, a really important time to, to, to get them in life so they can you know, have a positive impact on well, themselves first and then, and then everyone else. I, I, I want to I say three things, uh, address three things you just said. So uh, uh, I don't believe in, in God at all whatsoever, um, but I'll tell you, the listeners, a truth. If you despise someone, talk shit about someone, God will make sure you never be that person. If you look down at successful people, if you're jealous of successful people, if you hate on Jeff Bezos for going to space, you are never going to space. Stop hating on people because I promise you, God will make sure you never make it there. When the guy drives by in the Lamborghini, don't talk shit about him. Be like, wow, he must have worked really hard for that. I wonder what his secret is. I'm so happy that human beings are able to afford these beautiful things. And remember all the jobs that creating that Lamborghini and innovation that went into it and souls and love and power, the, de the details in the paint, the engine, the way the door closes, all of that. Stop hating on people. God will not give you success if you hate on the successful. And that's why yeah, someone doesn't believe in God, so I don't know how God does that, but I, I believe in that kind of God. Uh, free. When he says he's giving jiu-jitsu away free, he's not giving it away free. He's paying for it. His students are paying for it. There's nothing free. This man is doing it for other people. And the third thing is, is what you said about 12-year-olds, and this is more of a question for you. My son goes to a tennis instructor who's serious as a heart attack. I have my kids do uh, tennis uh, three to five days a week, martial arts five days a week, and skateboarding seven days a week. Keep them busy, busy, busy. And I have three boys, two four-year-olds and a six-year-old. And the tennis instructor told me that the worst thing that can happen to a tennis player is the desire to want to win. Because once you start wanting to win, there's such a steep learning curve and learning all the technique and the strategy that once you start wanting to win, you start abandoning technique and strategy and you start getting sloppy and put winning ahead of uh, skill. And he says in the, that's the hurdle for a 12-year-old boy or 12-year-old girl. Between 12 and 13, their desire to win interferes with their ability to learn. So I wonder if you need to get them before 12 because at 12, they don't have the humility that's needed to be good at jiu-jitsu. What do you think? No, I, th I think that's exactly it. Uh, <clears throat> text that comes up. Yeah, I think that's exactly what uh, it's just that you're so impressionable, you know, still at that j just below that, you know, I think you start to kind of become a, a man or a, or a, or a woman when, when you right around that, that 12 age, you know, I think, you know, they, they start to kind of hit puberty and they, they start to really identify with who they're really going to be in life. You know what I mean? And I think, I think that's kind of it. Uh, I think that's, I, I, you know, for me, I just did it by, uh, by, uh, you know, uh, failure, you know, like, uh, I, I just uh, tried with everyone that I could. And that just kind of seemed like the age where, you know, I, I had a lot of success was right around that 10, 12 area. It doesn't mean that a kid can't come in and be 15 and, you know, be incredible and he changes life. It's just on a big scale. I think that's when they make major, major, uh, you know, decisions in their life. And, uh, I, I think if you can get in there and, and do that. That's when uh, that, 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 that's when you can really make the most change for them. 
uh, I know I've said it a bunch of times. I don't usually plug someone this much. You guys have to see this documentary. The first five parts are out. There's tons of ancillary videos coming out from the entire crew now, but you got to get in and watch these first five. And they're called Daisy Fresh, an American Jiu-Jitsu story or tale. There's episodes one through five that are free on YouTube. It sounds like if you want to like get ahead of the curve and you're not a cheap fucker like me, you can actually go to Flow Grappling. They did an amazing job. I, and I started following Flow Grappling. I can't believe I'd never followed them before. Um, but the first five episodes are out. They're 30 to 40 minutes long, I'd say, 50 minutes long. Watch them with your kids. They're awesome. They're fantastic. Um, and, uh, Heath Pedigo, who we have on right now is, I, I don't know. I don't know. We're, I, I guess we're 40 minutes in and we still don't know the story cause I'm just too excited to get to it, but I'll try to dig in right here. How, tell me about the start of this gym. So, uh, this exact gym, no detail is too much, by the way, no detail is too much. So, uh, when, when I, uh, when my brother and I first saw the first UFC, we decided like uh, right on the spot for me, I, I knew and at 10 years old, this is what I wanted to do. Um, not as much. I just wanted to be involved with, um, with that, you know, it was like, we had already boxed and, and uh, we, we had already been, we were rough kids, you know, we were already constantly like, you know, like mixing it up on the street and like running around. We were just kind of rough, you know, my, my, my dad was, he, he was a little rough. So it was like, and all his friends were around and, you know, we were really big boxing and watching that and uh so the second that i saw it i thought man was your dad uh, in a motorcycle gang no no okay they, just checking uh, didn't even have a motorcycle he's uh, uh he, yeah he's a rough guy though, so for sure <laughs> he definitely like uh it's uh we would uh my dad would he, he would be out you know and, like he, he was uh have you seen a, Bron a bronx tell i think that's what it is where they're or maybe Goodfellas, where all the guys are down in the basement and they're all like gambling, and the kids like, no, like uh, there's like drink, you know, these like the kids shooting the dice for them. That, that was my life, like growing up, like you know, being around that and seeing that stuff. And uh, uh, so anyway, we see we see if we see the UFC when I was ten, and I just immediately wanted to like wrestle around and, and, and do jujitsu all the time. And at that in, in my life, I hadn't really uh, thought about like wrestling. You know, what I, mean? I thought more about like the jujitsu. But I saw Hoist do that, so I was like, "Man, I want to learn all the stuff that that guy knows." So I, uh, I saved up a bunch of money, and it was like eight bucks a month to get this newsletter that the Gracie sent out. So I uh, sent that off, and I got that. And then when it started coming, I was like, "Man, this is kind of bullshit. It's more like self defense." And I feel like uh, I don't know a lot of the stuff that I would get into, like in the magazines. It just seemed like everyone was just trying to make money off of each other. You know what I mean? It was like. Man, which I get, I, I, I get, I understand it, but that, that wasn't me. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to, uh, you wanted to learn how to fight. I wanted to learn how to fight and I wanted to help teach people how to fight. And I wanted to get a bass team and, you know, uh, uh and I wanted to, to kind of get, not necessarily get out of Mount Vernon, but I wanted to get out there and just, you know, like test myself against other people in other countries and other places. And, uh, you know, so, you know, living in California, it's such, you know, while I was out there, there there's a big difference. Uh, you know, being from there, it's like you're already almost in another country in another place, you know, than the rest. When you're in the Midwest, it's just it's so small. And I think it's easy for people to get trapped and feel trapped when they, they live in these tiny, tiny towns. You know, they almost seem like black holes sometimes, no matter. And that, that's just a human. Uh, that's just a human thing, too. You know, people uh, it's really easy. To, to, you know, the, the governor in your brain constantly gives you excuses like, hey, you know, go home. It's easier there. You know, people, you know, so and so can get you a job. And uh, so, you know, it's scary. It's scary to fucking get out and uh, you know, make things happen, and, uh, you know, not make excuses. And, and it's tough to do that. But right at 10, man, I already, I already wanted to, to leave and go and learn and be like a samurai and learn as many as I could and just soak up everything. And uh, I have these notebooks. I still have them today. There's like, there's hundreds and it's like front to back and it's like a, it's like you know a rain man wrote them it's like if someone else read them i don't even they would be able to understand them it's like i would write on them uh, upside down and uh, you know when i was laying down stretching and it's just all these plans that i had and all these moves that i wanted to learn and uh you know uh, they're like detailed uh you know like like webs of okay if it starts here it goes there and it goes there and i would i would just watch these vcr tapes and and, and make this shit up so, I would get the neighbors and the neighbor kids would come over and they realized it was, I wouldn't want to come. So my brother and I would pay them, you know, we'd give them a couple dollars to like let us uh, try moves on them. And wow. Just, 
yeah, yeah, just kind of kept growing and literally we tried to get anyone that, 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 that we could, uh, you know, to come in and uh, uh, train with us. Well, by come in, I mean train out in the grass. Uh, and then my brother worked a job for like uh, – Hey, were other kids to, um, allowed at your house? Like were the other parents like, oh, shit, you can't go over to the, the Pedigo's house? Did those – fucking guys are crazy yeah you're exactly exactly how it was. <laughs> my, my, my we had dad, a family like your family on the block i know yes, i know the rules mom, about your house it, it's kind of funny though you know my, my, dad, my dad, i don't know how to turn this off it's okay it's my show you can you can even take the call you want to take the call it's fine we're easy uh, here we're easy i'm, I'm, I'm on i'm on uh, alejandro's computer and he, uh he's got a lot of late friend so he keeps getting buzzed and <laughs> so george actually does anyone who's seen our youtube channel it's uh it's it's done really well i think in like four months it got like twenty thousand subscribers i guess that's a lot i don't know much about it's a lot that. it's a lot it's so good it's kind of funny in my mind he works so hard on doing this stuff i mean he literally does it all by himself he doesn't have any help and uh, four months ago he had never touched a camera he'd never touched a computer and basically got like a a YouTube uh, book for dummies, basically, and he just learned how to to make these videos and shoot. This is gorgeous, George. Yep, yep, all, all by himself. So anything that's on there, um, Alejandro's brother works out in Hollywood, actually, and he uh, he he had helped with the first couple, and then after that, George just completely does it all by himself. So sometimes he'll be editing for like you know literally like thirty hours to kind of yep. to, to kind of make those videos and and, and do stuff. So uh, I but, know uh, that world. Yeah, yeah. So it's he's he's really amazing. Without him, we couldn't do any of that stuff because I'm like uh, illiterate when it comes to all this computer stuff. But uh, anyway, so uh, uh, yeah. So so my 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 dad and, and mom they're 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 wonderful people though, man. It's like the, growing up, they like buy everything for everyone in our community, new shoes for all the kids, and we didn't have any. But uh, they would. Uh, Are your parents still alive? Yeah, they're, they're still alive, still together, still like the, the literally the. Uh, the most uh, opposite couple that you can imagine. He's like a wild, like he's got the balls of a 17 year old still, you know, he's like a, a aggressive and like uh, my mom's like this. She's like Amish almost. She's like the sweetest lady. All she's ever done uh, her entire life is just give, 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 man. She was a school teacher for about 42 years and she wow. had six, six days of work in 42 years. Uh, she had two years of sick days when she, um, would excuse me when she retired she had two six sick days and uh she actually like donated them she didn't uh she didn't get anything for them you know so she she gave her life crazy yeah she would just teach i mean she would she was in a really really poor community and uh she would uh she would pick these kids up walking to school you know when it was uh she would go over to their house you know they would have like lice or they would you know had just parents that were on drugs and she would go over to their house and clean their houses and, you know, buy them new clothes. I remember going out to her school and I would randomly see kids that would have shirts that would say like Pedigo on the back of them. Like mom, fuck, that's my baseball shirt. You know, and she, and she would always, (laughs) yeah, she, she would always tell us uh, the same thing. Look, you're good looking kids. You're, you're athletic. You got a lot going on. You don't need that stuff. It's just stuff they need it. You know, they, they don't even have a dad. They don't, they don't have a mom. So at Christmas time, we would buy presents. We would pick the stuff out. And a lot of time mom and dad, they would wrap the stuff and they would just give it away to other people. You know what I mean? So it was like, uh, that kind of became what, what our, what our life was like. And, uh, uh, but you know, at the time when I was a kid, I was like, man, this sucks. You know what I mean? But you know, now looking back, yeah, I exactly yep. what they were doing which is kind of like, uh, you know, what I'm doing with the gym. So I think that just all kind of comes from, uh, you know, no matter how wild dad was and how, how sweet and great mom was, I think just a, a lot of that's like a, you know, kind of, kind of thing. And, uh, you know, without them, I might not have the mindset that I do, you know, when I, to get all these, these guys, and it's not just you guys, uh, we have guys show up that are 40, you know, they just went through a divorce and they, they, they've worked. I saw the cop that you trained, the guy who won the, the masters and white and all the belts, except he only has black to go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of these guys, man, you know, they will be, uh, you know, you never really know what you want to do in life. It's like, you ask people and they're, they're like, they're like 40 years old. You, 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 they, what do you, they always have the same joke. I'm still trying to figure it out. 
And I think, you know, as humans, we kind of run around in life and half the time, I, I sometimes I wonder if anybody knows what the hell they're doing. You know what I mean? No, they don't. They don't. I, I, I have this talk on my podcast all the time. I never knew what I wanted to be. And then my wife wanted kid. my girlfriend of 20 years wanted kids. And so we had kids. And this is the first time I've ever felt being a dad is the first time where I, I like because people be like, I'm, I've made 10 movies, you know, and I've never called myself a movie director. I have four movies that are in the top 10 all time on iTunes for documentaries. I still wouldn't call myself a director. I don't think of myself as a, as much of a photographer uh, and I've or editor and I've done all that stuff. I'm a master at that stuff. But when I became a dad, I'm like, fuck, I'm a dad through and through. And this podcast thing, I actually feel like I'm kind of like a podcaster, but I've never I never knew what I wanted to do. I agree uh, with you. Never. I don't. I don't think anyone does. I think you just kind of go through life. And sadly, I think people go through their entire life sometimes and they just never figure it out. You know, they become, uh, you know, you, you work at a factory and, and that, it's okay. You know, it's okay to do that. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's, but, did but, you want to be a good person, Heath? When did you, did you want to be a good person? When I was a kid, I wanted to be a gangster. And, and then, then uh, and then something happened and you don't want to be, now you want to be a good guy. Man, my, my friends just started getting killed, and, uh, you know, they, they, they just, they, they, they were constantly in trouble. And I've actually never tasted alcohol in my entire life. It was, like, uh, interesting enough, I, I had a I had a friend who, his dad just beat the shit out of him. And the, the, I never understood his dad was such a nice guy. He was an amazing guy. But when he would drink, he would come home and just beat his ass, man. And we were really little. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, I, I would, I would, uh, I would be over there and he would come home and then he, he would tell me, Hey, you need to leave. And I would always remember the way that he smelled, you know? And then for me in my mind, uh, I remember the first time they, they, they tried to, to, to get me to like t- taste alcohol. And I was probably like seven or eight years old and uh, some older guys in the neighborhood. And I remember that smell was the same exact smell that my friend's dad had. And I was never interested because of that. It was like, and that always stuck with me in life. So, which is a great thing because I would probably be completely nuts, you know, if I I would have drank and been in trouble. You've so never I, had alcohol in your life? Never tasted it. Even if it was put on something, I, 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 I've never tasted it. Uh, and I, I'm not saying that I'm a, like a anti-alcohol. It's just for me, human, it's not something that I'm interested in. And uh, so much bad shit. It's stupid. It's pretty stupid. Uh, I would see so much bad shit, you know. And I always felt like people needed they, – they, the only reason they needed alcohol is because, like we said, they just don't know what the fuck they're doing or the, the, the way that they feel. They can't control, like, their – you know, their, their emotions as a human, and they need help doing that. And uh, I just think – I always thought there's there's other directions. Mine was, like, jiu-jitsu, you know, and, like, fitness. Like, if I felt that way, if I felt anxious, I'd just run 10 miles. And uh, I'm talking about when, when, when I was uh, uh, 10 or 11 or 12 years old. I would just go out and do pull-ups or basketball or – run around go swim whatever it was i just never wanted to uh man so i'm gonna that- say something i'm gonna say something really crass here i apologize alcohol is for you've been with the girl for three years and you're afraid to eat her pussy so you should probably drink a little and get to it that's what alcohol's for no, just for sure to not. like <laughs> no, I, I agree. I, and, I like and that's that. it. It's a medicine. It's a medicine but it's it but this drinking and watching football is just it is just idiocy so when I was a kid, I didn't wait three months to eat the pussy. I just went after it the first day. So I didn't need right, right. alcohol. So you didn't so, need alcohol. Yeah, no, I never needed it, man. I was just, right. I was just, I was just ready to go. But I'm, I'm really. I was scared. Know. I was scared. I needed a little alcohol to eat the pussy. I was scared. But, but, but it's a medicine like that. It's like, it's like good like that. Sure. It's good and, like that, that. and that's kind of always how I, I thought of it in my mind. I just thought, man, I, I just, I noticed with my friends that they would get nervous, or it's about like, hey, you know, we're gonna mix it up with these other dudes, and then they would drink, and I was, just, I was just always kind of ready to go. You know what I mean? So. Did you ever smoke that, cigarettes? No, my dad smoked our whole life, so uh, basically through him, I smoked my whole life. But no, I, I never, I never smoked, um, never smoked cigarettes. I've never done any drugs. I've never. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I've, I've just never done any of that shit, man. And it's kind of funny. There, there wasn't a whole lot of reasons other than that that I didn't. I just, kind of didn't, you know, I just had. To, I was so infatuated with wanting to learn um, everything about like traveling and about jujitsu and uh, you know. What so, made you so, think you were good enough to open your own dojo? I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm afraid I'm going to lose you and not get some of these questions answered. I apologize. No, no, no. It's what made a, you think you were good enough to – I, I, I kind of want to go back and talk about when you got your first gi and how you got promoted up to a black belt. But, but I'm really curious how, what, gave, what gave you the self-confidence to be like, okay, I'm going to rent this fucking dilapidated building and I'm going to start training people in it. What made you think you were good enough to do that, to give back I think, like that? 
I think from the, from the beginning, man, I just, uh, that, that's what we did. You know, we, we already were like teaching, uh, you know, 12, 13 years old because so I, I guess I didn't really ever know any better than to, uh, when, when it was just me and my brother and then whoever else you had to teach people or else you had no one to train with. Yeah, that, that was it. I, you know, and, and then we started kind of getting some wrestlers and then I wanted to show the wrestlers the you know, the jiu-jitsu stuff from the bottom, the submissions and the sweeps. And then, so I just kind of was always teaching. So I actually don't believe like, yeah, someone needs to be a black belt to open a gym. I understand the perspective on that. I understand where they're trying to come from. But uh, and, and today it's a lot different. You know, you, you can, you can, especially in California, you can walk 15 feet and there's a new gym out there and, you know, there's, there's something. You know, I hear it was like, there, there was just nothing, man. There was nothing like that. There was actually a time when, um, when Tap Out Clothing sponsored me. So I went out, Dan had reached out to me from Tap Out Clothing. I took a bus out to, uh, out to Connecticut for the North American Graphic Championships. And uh, I was 15 and I took a bus out there and it was like 30 hours each way. And I had never, th this, th this was the first, this is before I went to California. This is the first time that I had left. And, uh, the bus went through like four New York city and I had layovers and I remember walking around and, uh, and just, uh, th that was probably the biggest, most eye opening experience in my life. Just seeing other people and hearing the way that they talk, talk different. You know what I mean? And I had heard people from like Kentucky come up, you know, they, like, like, like the hillbilly hammer, you know, they sound a little bit different, but out in New York, everyone was like, you know, they were kind of like brash and it, it was like, uh, the, the different thing was, um, in, in the big cities, no one gets shit about it. It's like, you just don't exist when they're walking by. If they bump yeah. you, it's happen. And where I'm from, even though the people are hard, they're kind though too. If you need to get out, they would let you, if your car broke down on the side of the road, 15 people would stop in the traffic and they would push your car. That's just, it's just like a way of life in, in the West. Not wonderful, wonderful people everywhere. It's just sometimes in the bigger cities, in the bigger states, people are just, they're in a big fucking hurry to go nowhere. You know what I mean? And they're like, scared and they're scared. Everyone in the city's scared. It's yeah, a bunch it, of pussies. I, I don't, I shouldn't call them pussies cause I kind of feel sorry for them, but everyone's so scared these days that yeah. everyone's afraid they're going to scratch their, their break a nail. It's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, a, you know, and I, I think the small towns in the Midwest are just, they never, they never moved forward, you know, on the, uh, uh, well, that would be moving backwards, actually. But you know, you know what I mean. They just uh, there's still just a yeah. lot of like, there's a lot of community still. You know, if you see someone that's struggling, and uh, uh, you know, I see stuff all the time. Like uh, on um, if uh, I, I don't use social media very much, but if I if I see on Facebook, I'll get a notification like uh, you know, like uh, so and so needs help in the in the the public community thing. You know, and every time I look at it, you know, it's usually like uh, someone was on drugs and they're asking for stuff for their kids. But and now for 50 people are on there and saying like, we can go to Goodwill, we can get you a couch, we have an old couch. It just seems always open to helping other people, you know. And uh, I think the lesson that the the world could, uh, you know, that, that they could take from that, 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 like the Southern hospitality thing, you know, that's real. It really exists. And uh, you know, it does just, exist. Yeah, it does. You know, and uh, you know, just smiling and telling someone, you know, hey, you know, have a good day. You know, just being kind and uh. You know, dude, life's already so hard. You know, what I mean, it's even harder when some, you know, someone's a fucking asshole. For no reason. You know, you can see people. You can just look at people. Usually, you know, not to fuck with them. You know, or that they're 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 they're, they're just unapproachable. And that's the that yep. I felt being at New York. Everyone was just unapproachable. I, I wanted to walk around, but you know, I didn't want to get lost. You know, so I I just kind of, kind of went out there. Anyone that I would ask for help, it was in Union Station. It was like the biggest thing that I'd ever seen, you know what I mean? Like the sea is the biggest thing that I ever seen. And this was, I was taking so much in, man. And, uh, I was on the way to this tournament and I had like a five hour layover there. And, uh, I remember I wanted to get out and kind of, you know, kind of walk around a lot, but you know, I, I was a little scared. And then I, I remember, uh, on the, on the bus ride back, I was, I was ashamed almost that I didn't, that I was there and that I didn't get out and like, you know, see, you know, some of these buildings and some of these places. And I had made a map before I went, I had like, uh, found some, you know, the internet barely existed then. I mean, right, like, right. Yeah, you got to get a map from AAA. Yeah, yeah. I had to go to school. You know, there was a, remember the map <laughs> quest things, you know, you'd be driving and follow them and miss your fucking exit every time. It never failed. And, uh, and right. I always thought map quest uh, and the, the Garmin GPS is always thought that they had a deal with like the hood. You know, it's like the shortcut was always taking you through a shitty neighborhood. <laughs> <with your family. laughs> but, uh, you could steal your shit. 
Yeah, yeah. So no, anyway, that's um, I, I went out there and I did my first tournament, and I had only trained in the grass with my brother. He hadn't rented a house yet to where we could uh, train train on the carpet. And uh, I went out and I did the tournament and I won. And uh, when and I and you were fifteen. I was 15 and I beat <clears throat> some of these guys from these big schools like Henzo Gracie had a giant school that was out there. And when I saw those names, I was almost a little intimidated. Oh man, this wait, so you're 15 and you entered a grappling competition by, and you went there on a 30 hour bus ride by yourself and you entered and won and then, and then took the bus home. Yeah. And there's this real big trophy. I still have it actually. It's a- Where did you and sleep I- that night? Um, actually, so I was going to just sleep, sleep outside. It, it really wasn't, that wasn't a big deal for me, you know, like at, at the time it's, uh, actually still now, even today, it's like, uh, when we get hotel rooms with the guys, a lot of times, you know, there'll be 15 of them. We'll really just sleep on the floor with the guys still. It's a, uh, and as horrible as that sounds to everybody that's out there, it's, it's really not that bad, man. You know, it's, there's just so much camaraderie and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, for me, it's always just been a part of it, man. And I think that's one of the things that sets our apart from the teams that they say oh man you know like oh no we're brothers and you know it's like having friends at school you remember when you're in high school and you had someone in your class and they were like your friend you talked to them you ate lunch with them but after school and after you graduated you never saw them again if there wasn't a facebook you would never speak to them again and yep. sometimes these people were literally some of your best friends in life you know your, your best times enjoying life at school or like with guys like that or girls like that that's what jujitsu for most places is like for people, you know, like they have friends at jujitsu and they use the word brotherhood and they use the word family, but they don't know shit. They don't know each other's kids. They've never been to each other's house. The boys at this gym, they are, they're real friends. They're real brothers. They're closer with them, each other than most of them don't even have families anyway. It's, you know, like the Jacob Couch's story, man, it's, it's such an incredible story. His mom dropped him off at the babysitter because she wanted to get high and she just never came back to get him. Never. Is that the Australian kid? That's uh that's the hillbilly hammer. Oh, that's okay. On there. So, you know, she, she, she just dropped him off and uh, you know, so he grew up as his grandma finally like adopted him and, and got him and, you know, she had nothing. And uh, she, you know, he, he grew up his entire life. You know, he, he was a child. Fairy. He had no idea. And, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you something. Now, Mountain you know, Dew instead of water. He talked about that. That shit freaks me out. I'm a big anti-sugar guy. I think sugar is Satan. And when he told me that they were giving him fucking Mountain Dew as, as a, instead of water because there wasn't clean water as a kid, that's, that's a hard one for me to – that breaks my heart. Well, it's tough, right? I mean, you see, and especially in the Midwest and a lot of these uh, little towns, you know, like obesity, like runs rampant. It's, uh, it, there's way more of that in the middle of the United States than there is. Uh, wherever the Bible Belt is, you can usually find really overweight, um, judgmental people, unfortunately. It's kind of funny how those things go hand in hand, but uh, it's, uh, they, he didn't have running water in the house until he said, I think that he was like, 11 or 12 years old so they would have a well that they would go and they would they would put the bucket up and uh you know when when you hear it like that it's like uh even me it's like we uh we were poor you know what i mean uh, you know my mom didn't make much being a teacher i remember she said she started in 1974 and her first paycheck was four thousand bucks so uh, yeah yeah and the place that she came from was like a little tiny town and there were like 200 people there and my dad had 15 brothers and sisters so they were obviously like a uh, really poor family. One of his brothers actually, at, at one point, they had a, the, the their farm that they were working on. Apple wasn't working. It was right after the depression, and uh, my dad's brother, uh, he, uh, he, he, they were so hungry and like famine that he, uh, he basically starved to death. He got pneumonia, and then he died. And uh, so, I mean, they, they were from real struggle, man. Like, uh, I think a lot of people in the United States don't even realize that this shit is real, and that it, you know, it's, you know, it, it's still happening. Oh, it's but, real. And some people just won't ask for help. You know what I mean? It's a, which is a curse in itself sometimes. You know what I mean? It's good to be tough and, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and do all that. But sometimes, sometimes people just need a little bit of help. You know, people can take advantage of getting help, but sometimes just people just need a little bit of help, man. And uh, that's, um, that, that's, unfortunately, I feel like right now, Heath, that 90% of the help people get hurts them. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, when my boy started learning how to walk, I would walk him every day, like, you know, I would walk him a mile every day in the beginning, right? And he's one years old, and it would take three hours to walk a mile. And in that mile, and I'm not exaggerating, he would fall 500 times. Every three seconds, he would fall. 
and I would see other parents pick their kids up, but I never picked my kid up. That's not my job as a parent. He fell, and now he earned the opportunity to stand up and, and get those quads and glutes and balance and everything stronger. My job was to turn around and make sure a car doesn't hit him, alligator doesn't come out of the bushes and eat him. My job is to, to protect him while he deals with the struggles of real life and gets stronger. And I feel like today's society, helping people is about picking them up. And, that's not, and, 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 and what you're doing when you do that is you're stealing from people. So, and I don't feel like, and you do, and, and, and you do that. You do, you give people, it, it's kind of, it, this is cheese dick, but my mom said it all the time. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. And that's what you've done. You've laid out a trough of water and, uh, and, 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 and those who can, who want to take big gulps can come over and take big gulps. Yeah. And, uh, and it's fascinating. It, it, it's, it's funny. We were in the airport yesterday and, uh, and, and George Valdera. So, so George's story. And my kid has a huge, at six years old, my kid has a huge, muscular, bulbous ass because he fucking did 500 burpees a day his whole entire life. And I never walked over and stood him up. Sorry. You're in the airport. Sorry. You're in the airport with George. Sorry. Drew, I agree with everything you said. It's just a little something that he said, what you're saying, remind me of that yesterday. Uh, One of the parents inside, the kid, he's running in the airport and he falls flat on his face. And not only the mom, but five other people ran over to just immediately make the kid cry. And that's what you said. And I I hadn't really thought about it, but they said, oh, are you you okay? Are you okay? They made him upset when he fell down. Well, outside, there's a a Hispanic family, you know, George's from Nicaragua, and the kid's running. And this kid falls, I mean, fucking literally flat on his face. His skins his face up, and his mom told him, "Boy, get up!" And he got up, and George looked over at me and he said, "That's the difference between where I'm from and here. It's literally everything you just said." And you know what? The kid, the kid got up, and he didn't even think about crying because it probably would have whooped his ass right there on the spot. Now, that's a whole other uh, conversation, but I do agree with everything you're saying. Another thing that bothers me a lot uh, is uh, I had to learn this, uh, you know, coaching at the gym. Uh, you have to be careful how much you give. So it's a, like if I take these boys and I would allow them to live in the gym and just train full time and not have jobs and not go to school, they're just children of welfare. Meaning, yep. uh, people make the, the people make the uh, they sometimes people think if you're poor and you grew up poor, you grew up in the ghetto, you grew up in the hood, and you don't have to grow up in the hood of the ghetto to be. You know what I mean? You can you can be from a working class family and not have shit, and uh, you know just just getting by sometimes it's a harder in life, you know, being, being just under middle class, like having two working class parents, sometimes that disqualifies you from any help at all. And it's barely enough to get by that struggle in itself as well. And a lot of people don't realize that, but, um, you know, if, if you're constantly giving, so like everyone out there who like wants to run a gym or you want, whatever you have and you, you want to help people, I think it's important to not, uh, mix up. People say like, Hey, so-and-so is rich. You know, a lot of people think automatically if someone's poor that they're tough. And one thing that I found out, a lot of boys that I get that are from really poor families, they grew up in the project, it's actually the opposite. They've been given everything their entire life. They're from families that weren't ever interested in working. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to say that they were just on the take. I don't know what their situation was, but, you know, uh, mom mom maybe wasn't able to work because dad wasn't around so he never worked so there, there just wasn't a lot of work ethic there and they kind of think that everything should be given to them or somebody owes them you know and uh you know people think rich people haven't made the especially really wealthy people the richer you get and the uh the more famous you get it is that, you're, that means more work and hard work it doesn't mean that you get to kick your feet up because you made your first million bucks. It's not the way it works. And uh, I think that's a misconception that, that sometimes people that don't have much think about rich people. It's like, yeah, he's rich. He didn't have to work where most of the time to become rich and stay rich or whatever word you want to use, you got to bust your ass, man. You know, and it, the, the more you get, the tougher it gets. And, you know, the, the, the more you move up in the world, whether it be the corporate world, or, you know, you're being self-made, whatever. You constantly have to keep working. If you don't, you lose everything that you made. And um, the the only way that I stay rich is that I live poor. It's it's true. It's it, a, it resonates with me 100. percent I live so fucking poor. What does that mean? That means um, I have the same underwear that I've had for um, 
10 years, but, um, but I have all of that money that would have cost to replace my underwear over the 10 years in the bank making interest. And yeah, it's no, just, it, it's the way you have to do it. If you want to be, if you want, if you want to live rich, you, or if you want to be rich, you got to live poor. And, and obviously there's exceptions to the rule. There's people who are printing money, you know, who are selling Google ads, but, but for, for the most of the people you see driving like their fucking minivans around town, don't get them. Don't think the guy driving the Escalade is richer than he is because uh, they're spending their money. No, for sure. And uh, when it comes to being a leader, you have to have the same mindset. You know what I mean? It's like it's easy to get up on the horse, man. And I see a lot of these um, these uh, guys at tournaments. And what happens, unfortunately, in the jiu-jitsu community, uh, people make they, – they'll open up gyms. And these guys become kings of their kingdom. The gym is their the boss. It's their right. way the way. And uh, that's not really uh, – there's a difference between, you know, the boss and the lead. You know what I mean? It's like – I, and at my situation, part of the reason uh, that pe people, people always ask me, what, what is it about that? So I'll come in for these seminars, these camps that I do. That, that's where you heard the 30-hour the, the seminar trajectory. Um, they, uh, they always ask me about jujitsu. Like, what, are, what, what moves are you guys doing at the gym? They never ask me about the environment. And I, it's, it's kind of funny. I'll come into these uh, these three-day camps, and they, they always want to know everything about what are the guys doing to win? It, the physical aspects of it, you know, what, what, what drills are you doing? What training are you doing? And the thing that they never ask me as coaches is what about the environment? What kind of environment, what is making people come stay? I have the same last night we had uh, like the culture there that they, they, they're not asking about when you say the environment, you mean like the culture? Yeah. yeah. It's a, uh, it's this, it's that when you walk into the room with your kids that your kids are a they're telling you dad we're going to be late we got to go they want to go they want to be at this place you know they <laughs> they, they want to get there because it's fun and they're, they're, they they feel supported and their friends are there and, you know it's like they're not there they're thinking about being at the place because it's just such a positive place and uh it's funny no one, no one any they don't ever ask me about that what what how do we breed or build the culture that you have at the gym where people are able to grow and they're able to, you know, accomplish uh, things in their mind and, 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 you know, and, and just want to keep getting better and make everyone around them better. And that kind of answers the question, but uh, they always just ask me about the physical jujitsu, you know, it's like, um, if you go to a tournament, we have the Nogi worlds in two weeks. I have a list and these lists are, where is that at? That is in Garland. It's Dallas, Texas, basically a little suburb. Okay. Outside of Dallas, so our team will go, and we just we just had the Nogi Pans. The Nogi Pans is the second biggest, uh, because of COVID, it had currently been the biggest like IBJJF Jiu Jitsu team thing. You know, like uh, like there are bigger shows, like the Flow Graphic stuff is a bigger show. But as a team of people who haven't really made it to that next age, that these tournaments, the Nogi Pans and Nogi Worlds, they're the biggest ones. So our team, the little team from Mount Vernon, we actually won. And let me tell you this works real quick. Say like. Um, so, so a lot of these teams like Atos or Gracie Baja or Checkmat, what will happen is they'll have 700 locations all over the world. You know, it's like they'll have a team in Venezuela, a team in Canada, a team in Rhode Island. And what happens is they take all of their points and they put them together. They don't know each other, but they all fight under one banner and they put their points together. For our team, we have a couple like small, small, like, uh, you know, clubs that, that are close. Affiliates? Yeah, there's a guy that's an hour away or whatever, and, uh, you know, he can't make it down all the time, so he opened up his own little spot, and he runs it, and, uh, you know, help him, and he'll still drive down and train three or four times a week, so we have a couple of those, but as a whole, it's just, you know, the, 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 the team in Mount Vernon, there might be one or two competitors from, you know, like Nashville, Tennessee, what we have Jim and Franklin, or just something like that, so it's on a, on a tiny level, but us going up against these huge, it's kind of, the, to me, they're like corporation gyms almost, you know, they're like McDonald's and going, and, uh, these guys have never met each other before. You know, they don't know each other. They'll, they'll meet in the finals and, and they, they do a thing. It's called close out. They, they won't go against each other. They don't even know each other. They'll be from different, different dude. My boys at the gym, when they, finals, they they'll, the, the, they'll do the match again and they'll try to kill each other because can you imagine with your brother if you would have let your brother win the first time that you would have did something at home your brother would have said yeah but i let you win and then you'd want to kick his ass you know what i mean so i just told him look we don't and i, I think 
that, that, that kind of all goes in on, on, you know, just that mindset all goes in on a scale. Dude, I, I'm just a soldier with the guys that they trust enough to be their leader. That's it. And that, that's the relationship that I have with them. It's not, I'm the boss. It's my way or the highway. I go in, uh, and they know, man, I, I get it in with them. I'm, you can I'm tell, not. you can tell in the documentary. I, uh, I, I, this isn't, a, I'm not being critical, by the way, about saying this. I, whoever made that documentary, Flow Grappling, or the producer, whoever, kudos to you. It, it, this is just my own bias. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of you in it, just because I was curious. But I mean, fuck, it's, it's like you only have 50 minutes, and, the, and you're pretty humble. But I, when I do see your relationship with them, I see it's very, very free and open. And it's the relationship that I I want to have with my sons um are, are you married heath no no i i'm i'm not married I, I, i've been with the, the the same same girl for a long, long time though so yeah basically basically Do you have I'm kids married. i have two i have two boys they're two weeks apart you have two boys and they're two weeks apart so two different moms so you're like a riddle right yeah that's amazing and is that a, is that a happy family like did that did you manage that good yeah, it's wonderful, man. I'm involved with uh, both the boys every single day. You know, I see them every day. I have a wonderful relationship with, with uh, you know. Oh, God, I love this. But, you know, it's like it's just uh, you, you got to figure all that out. It's easy, you know. It's like. Uh, Are the moms they're, friends? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're totally cool. It's just all about, you know, it's, it's not, not to sound like cheap, but, it's, you know, it's, no. it's, it's, a, it's about friends, man. It's, uh, and I think most men, especially in, in, in these situations where they'll split. From their, their kids' mom. Once they realize the mom doesn't want to be with them anymore, they kind of walk away from the the, the dad role. And uh, when when uh, me and my 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 first son's mom we split up, it's she's going to be with someone else. You know, sometimes that's hard. That, that that's that's hard to eat. But at yep. the end of the day, for me, I just told her, hey, look, we we had been together for. Uh, you know, uh, seven years, eight years. I know you're going to want to do whatever you're going to do. Just w whatever you're doing. I just, I, I would like Gavin. That, that's my son's name, Gavin. And I, I just, uh, it doesn't matter what you're doing. I don't care. You don't have to talk to me, but I don't want him to be with your mom. If you want to go, then you just holler at me. So I constantly bugged her every second. Hey, can I, uh, can I come out and pick Gavin up today? Even if that me just going out there, getting him and dragging him that he lives two minutes away from the school, I get to spend that two minutes and then that two minutes becomes four minutes and then five. And then the next thing you know, it's like a couple hours a day. And then, uh, you know, and it was always been every other day for me, but I just think there's always, you know, it's kind of funny when, uh, it's almost insulting to me sometimes when people say, a guy said this to me the other day, I making it to this. And he told me, well, look, man, my kids are my life. I don't think you should ever have to say that, especially to another parent. That, no shit. Everybody knows that already. You know that your kids are your life. You shouldn't have to say that out loud. You got to figure everything else out doing that. But uh, it's a. Uh, I, I just. I always explain out. that to me a little bit more. So you were asking someone, "Hey, why aren't you coming out to this tournament or to your class?" And they said yeah. because they prioritize their kids over that. Is that what the story? Yeah, well, yeah, everyone would do that. We get that. I get that. It's offensive. I have kids, you know. So does that mean since I went to the tournament, you're a better dad than me? Is that yeah, 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 yeah. So I think it's more like, and that's what I told the guy. You know, it's. Uh, I think by you just saying that, you know, I don't know if you're insecure as a dad. You feel like you need to say that out loud, you know. But uh, it's it's. Uh, I, I I just think at any situation, obviously, with your dad, you get this. Of course, your kids are your life. Nothing's more important than that. everything that you do is is you know to, to to benefit them you know and uh it's to, to it's an honor having kids no, it's an sure. honor and it's the only privilege in life fuck all other privileges people talk about it you should value raising a kid is it's the greatest thing ever how how, how old are your boys they're 13 one was born on friday the 13th and the other one was born on april fools and are they friends yeah they beat the shit out of each other but yeah they're friends they're like uh they're, they're, they're really close. They're both really, really athletic. They're, they're like, uh, one's really involved in wrestling and he's just kind of like, uh, and the other one's really big into like, you know, like the Midwest sports, baseball, basketball. So they keep extremely busy. Uh, uh, and they're, they're even, even the one who doesn't train, he's constantly at the gym. Like I said, the environment there, the culture, you know, it's like, uh, it's like he has 50 uncles. You know what I mean? It's like they're, since, since they've been little, they go in and they play. They, uh, even when they, I didn't want them to train when they were little. I, I actually wanted them to just uh, come and play at the gym. That way, always in their mind, they would always think about, they would always relate having fun 
and uh, an awesome place, you know, being the gym. So they'd want to go there to have a good time. So now that they're older, in their minds, they, they always ask me, here, we're going to run by the gym. It's just a place where they can go and, you know, uh, be happy and be themselves. And I think uh, I think that's important, you know, when you have kids that are training is to to, to, to make sure, as in, especially the instructors out there, I think, just not about jujitsu always. There's so much more to it than just jujitsu. You know what I mean? It's, it's not about teaching them the stuff so they can beat the other kids in the tournament. It's about you know them coming and being a part of something that's bigger than them. You know, it's it's uh, uh, j- just being able to be happy and and uh, that's the most important thing for me. Uh, Are you going to buy that property? So I'm actually trying everything. I can. There's another. So we, we we've just so grown out of it. And it's like uh, there were a couple before that that's not the first place that i had it's just like we've always gotten a little bigger um like the, a normal our first place you know that the, shit would never fly in california someone would be jealous and come shut your shit down you know that right oh yeah, yeah for sure definitely it's uh i'm extremely lucky to be and that, that's where the, the good you're doing there would never be tolerated in california they don't allow people to do that kind of good and it's kind of not- funny too. it's that's the place where the people would talk the most about being good and doing you know, so right. it's always how that, uh, but I'm really lucky, man. I, I grew up in the town and, uh, the town is always known like, Hey, the Pedigo brothers are like these wild, you know, they do like the, the UFC fights. And, uh, and at first back in the day when I got sponsored by tap out, if you would have a sticker on your car, that was like a tap out sticker, the police would pull you over. It's like in their minds, we were doing like the, the Kimbo slice, uh, backyard fights, you know, cause we were training in the yard. Uh, right. They, they, it's literally did a complete 180. You know, it's like uh, uh, that now all the police they train at the gym, and I, I really give back to to, to the, the the community, and they want to learn. You know, they they don't want uh, situations to happen where they could have controlled something and did better. You know what I mean? And uh, if if a lot of them had the same mindsets that a lot of the guys <clears> here, it would be very different. You know what I mean? It's like uh, so uh, I have a wonderful relationship with everyone in our community, all the way from the the. The, the poorest and roughest uh i still go down there where i'm you know where i'm from originally i go down there and i, t- I talk with everybody and you know and everybody from the other side of town and uh, uh we actually just got reached out to the downtown development center and they're actually trying to help us get a uh a bigger place it's two stories that way we can have a constant uh youth program going on all the time kids will be able to walk over from the grade school and uh so we're working on that right now if that happens uh, all the daisy fresh is, uh when i moved in there it's kind of funny I, I found the building and it was like just this empty old laundry mat and uh i don't think it had been a laundry mat for like 15 or 20 years you know in a couple like uh yeah like uh resale shops or whatever you know I tried to go in there and uh, it just didn't work out and uh, when we got it to play like american eagle like in shoe polish up on the window and stuff like that, and uh we, when we got in there, the, the landlord was from Australia. And I know that doesn't seem like a big deal out in California, but we already had the one Australian kid and uh, not learning. So having another one around, it was so wild that there was another guy from Australia in this tiny little town. But uh, so when he found out that Spatch was from Australia and that we had kind of like adopted him in, he just said, look, you can do anything with the building that you want, anything, tear down the walls, paint it, do whatever you want. But when I came here and like the, the, the early 80s the first business that i bought was this laundromat so just that sign i don't want anything to you know i I need that sign so at the time i was like yeah fuck that sign of course you know and now that thing has kind of became the uh, the guy showed me the other day there's two thousand check-ins from people that have checked in at that sign and they never came into train so like jujitsu people driving through mount vernon they didn't come to train they just would come at night and pictures with the sign because the yeah sign. i'd do it i don't even do jujitsu if i was ever in the area i'd go take a picture under that sign so no no, no matter what it's like uh so I, i'm always gonna keep the building man i'd like to really use it as a barracks for the boys today it's like jesse village there now man that people just literally keep coming and like george said earlier there's guys from romania uh, lithuania i got guys from uh kazakhstan that were there china uh two guys just showed up from oregon i mean there's literally 24 guys that are just staying at the gym right now they just stay there and uh um you know it's like they, they keep the things in each other's cars and uh it's uh i would actually start buying these uh these big uh you know the the, the big like uh passenger vans and the guys are ripping the the, the you know because you can pick them up you know if they don't run for like 400 bucks so we put them to keep it really clean you know because i don't i don't want 
the fucked up, you know, for the community out there. It's like they're cool enough to let us keep doing it. So I tell the boys, it's important that we make sure that it's it's not ever a, an, an eyesore on the town. You know what I mean? It's not, Doesn't look like a junkyard. Yeah, for sure, definitely. So the guys they buy these passenger vans and they'll, they'll they 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 they'll sleep in them. You know, there'll be like one or two of them. It's kind of funny. They'll put a a wall in the middle. And I think about that. Like how that that's like that's worse than jail almost. You know, like uh, to to you and I thinking, but uh, to them. That makes them free, like like George uh, here. If you one of my so actually two of my favorite scenes from the Daisy Fresh was uh when they're sitting on the back of the truck and one and two and they ask him what would you do if you never found the Daisy Fresh and he just said I probably would kill myself. Yeah. They ask a couple of the boys that. That's why this is important. It's not when when byproduct of you. And and. And what is that? Why do you think that just broken homes, dads that beat them, moms that don't love them, being molested, drug use at a young age, like what, what makes someone want to kill themselves? Man, you know, like, I, I think it's just, I think just life, life is tough. And the more that you try to, the more you try to figure things out, uh, the more you realize you don't know, you know what I mean? And I think it's just, I think it's just scary, man. I think it's scary to, to, to not understand about, you know, a lot of things. And a lot of times, one thing that uh, I, now people will probably not going to like this, but it is what it is. Uh, the one thing is the more kids that I get that have been brought up in really religious families, they're fucked up, man. They're like, uh, they're so confused and they're so, uh, they've had this, this, this stuff jammed down their throat the entire lives. And their, their dads, um, I have one kid, his dad's a preacher. And when I got him, he the most socially awkward um, asshole kid ever and uh, uh, one day uh, he, he told me it was like an eye opening experience for me he told me yeah well you know maybe if my dad took less time jamming this bible stuff down my throat and he taught me how to be a gentleman and you know play with the other kids and just, just was my dad instead of a preacher maybe he would uh, maybe I would understand you know things a little bit more and it's like that was uh, like a, a light going off in my head for for, for for me, you know what I mean. I realized the more of them that I got, they just, uh, you know, they, they've they're, they're scared. They, 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 yeah, you know, a lot of kids are scared, and they, they they've used that like religion or whatever as fear to like scare the kids. So they they they, they, they their whole lives are spent about you know like uh, trying to do this and trying to do that. And, and the thing is, is they they're they're not even being good people necessarily. They're, they're not trying to help other people. They're just they're just trying to make sure that their spot is secure for eternity rather than, you know, being out. Right. And, uh, you don't always say that to, if, you know, if you want to be religious or whatever, that, that that's cool. You can do it, do what you do, but you know, you got to be cool. You know, you got, don't be an asshole, you know, uh, be, be Christ-like, not Christian. You know what I mean? Just, uh, yeah. I'm torn. I was raised basically, uh, when you're, when you're raised in a, in a pretty hardcore liberal environment, there's this, uh, a constant underlying hatred for religion and country con constant underlying hatred for country. And it's, it's really subtle, but it's always there. It's from your teachers. It's from your parents. It's just from everywhere. Like if there's an American flag up or if the president says, God bless America, there's a, why does it have to be God bless America? Or why do we have to do the pledge of allegiance? And now that I'm older, and wiser, I realize the importance of religion for people. And the truth is, is that uh, we, we need a society full of people who, if they can't find their own morals or their own ethics or their own integrity, it needs to be given to them. And, and it, it, it's, it's tough. It's tough. I really, really, really um, would love to uh, live in a neighborhood full of, even though, uh, of Christ-like people, even though... Oh, Right, you know what I mean. I would love to live with like really authentic Christians or really authentic Mormons. I like, I like, but but you're right. You f you can fuck a kid up like, like there's a time and a place for that shit. And like no, sure. it, and, like you yeah. start telling kids masturbation is bad. You can't tell a 14 year old boy that. You better find a different approach because you're gonna yeah, fuck no, him up. No, I mean, cl and, and clearly it's like uh, it's <laughs> it, it's. I, I've been thinking about stuff with the military. It's uh. Yeah, there you go. And, and sorry, one more thing. And if you don't give people religion, these fucking morons will start to think Fauci is God, and they'll start to believe that the government is God. And I know you guys don't think that's what you're doing, but that's what you're doing. I hear you. When you start believing in fake things like gender, and you think that that's science as opposed to sex, you're starting to believe that someone else is God. You're having faith in something else. If you're going to have faith in something, at least 
at least let it be God. Don't be your don't be your government. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. It's uh, it, 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 all this stuff, and, and it's all true. And I think it's it, it's it's part of the you know to to, to get the question. I just think it's part of the. It, it makes people unsure. You know what I mean? Because it, at the end of the day, we're, we're we're animals, and we have animal instincts. You know what I mean? And it's like uh, you, you know, we're we're the closest things, obviously, to being civilized our animals but you know we, we we still have that survival instinct in us and it's like a lot of this stuff just doesn't make sense you know what i mean it doesn't make sense to uh, and then we spend so much time doing things that are that, that of, of unimportance i think in the end that people just feel lost and, and they wonder man i spent all these years uh doing this because mom and dad said that i should do this or because society said i should do this and then i think they just they just get extremely lost man. and i think that that causes like a lot of mental and uh, mental doubt for yourself and uh you know because the question was um I, you know like the, the 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 suicide and depression stuff just constantly goes up all the time i think that for me i think that has a lot to do with it Life, life's tough man you know what i mean but it can also be the most amazing incredible thing in the entire world i just think everything is balance you know what i mean and you just that, that's not, that, that's kind of a cop out to say that to just oh you got to find the balance but i mean i think you just have to really dig in and be honest with yourself about about you know just things like that uh, uh, i think that i think the balance is i think it is balance I, but i just think the balance is is that you should be working on yourself 90 percent of the time and 10 percent of the time helping other people instead of these fucking ad activists who are 90 percent of the time trying to change other people and spending zero time changing themselves these th the reason why you're able to do what you do right now at 38 years old is because for the first 30 years you worked on yourself and you built your own skills and you focused on yourself and you stayed busy and you cultivated and nurtured talent, success, hard work, discipline, and you became a mirror and a knife that other people should be able to emulate and yet you can do your own cutting and, 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 and you're your own tool. These, this, I, I, think it's, I, I think it is balanced, but it's not 50-50, people. If you are not working on yourself – you're 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 out of balance. I people because if when you work on yourself, other people will work on themselves. You don't have to force people to um like black people or like gay people or like just you you be that you be cool as shit. Yeah, no. I, and other I, people will be cool as shit. Look at Heath. He's cool as shit. And now he's got a fucking whole gym full of dudes who are trying to mirror him and be cool as shit. Yeah, you're. I'm I'm really lucky. To have that one, one, one thing I get a lot of guys I get a lot of guys that are from like uh so they'll they'll, they'll be married you know what I mean and their whole did you say married yeah they'll be married and they'll they'll, they'll, they'll get a divorce you know what I mean okay. it's like after they get a divorce they're so fucking crushed and they're uh -huh. lost and uh they've lost everything they just lost their entire lives and they ask me sometimes I don't know my wife would do this you know like she started seeing someone else or whatever it is or, or vice versa right. you know I have, I have a female that comes in uh and I always just tell them, you know, a little bit of this is your fault. You know what I mean? It's like at, 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 there's there's certain points when, um, listen, you have to be a little selfish to be successful. And I tell people this all the time. In relationship, being a dad, uh, it, be, being being a, uh, a being being a friend, if you don't take care of yourself, if you lose yourself, you know what I mean? This is the biggest one that happens with relationships. You meet this cool chick, you, you meet your, wife, you know what I mean? And when she met you, you were this young funny cool dude and the time you become your life becomes your family and this goes back to me saying like oh my kids are my life my family's my life yeah no shit you don't have to say that out loud though you don't you don't have to every move you make doesn't have to be you know for your family indirectly you know what i mean it's like if you're un if you're unhappy and you're depressed and you're you're everything you do is only for your kids family at the end you're gonna you can become miserable and you 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 know and people fall out of love in relationships because of this all the time you become someone else and at the end you uh you know you kind of become this needy desperate stressed out fat community. slob it's true and it happens all and it happens yep. all the time yeah and these guys and then when i tell these guys well this is a little bit your fault you know what i mean you you got away from being yourself and you got comfortable and and you uh you know, you, you kind of just told yourself like, oh, you know, my, my family's my whole life. Every move that I make needs to be to make my wife happy or to make my husband happy or to make my happy. But what about and uh, if you're not being a little selfish and uh, taking care of yourself, your mental health, your physical health, 
you know, you're, you're socially, you know what I mean? You, you will fail, you know, you will be in a position uh, to, to, to not be happy. We're just making everyone else happy. And then you'll feel unappreciated and you'll feel uh, distance. And I think that happens a lot. I think we, we constantly say that shit out loud. And uh, that's a little bit better answer for the, the question that you asked me earlier about my kids are my life. It's um, dude, you have to just be cool. You know what I mean? And you have to work on your Constantly. If it's eight o'clock at night and my kids are going to bed and they're like, "Will you come go to bed with me? Will you come go to bed with me?" and I haven't worked out yet, at least fifty percent, I have to ask myself the question: Am I going to put them to bed and then get up and keep and get my workout on for the day? And if the answer is no, then I don't put them to bed. Then my wife does it and I go work out. And you know what? It's only three minutes of their life before they fall asleep, but I get in the garage, and then now I'm happier, I'm fitter, I'm stronger, I'm a better example for them in the morning. There's thousands of things like that. If you're not working right. on yourself, true. your I wife believe. and your kids are going to fucking leave you, They're gonna and they're going to think you're a pile of shit. Even if they and, upset at you that you're working on yourself, you better like have an honest talk with yourself. It's true, and, and the mindset that that breeds too is like, you know, since I'm making my family – my, my, my life, you know, if you know, I'm the, my wife and my kid, I start to feel entitled, like, well, since I'm doing that, they do that. So then the more that I think that happens, you know, give me an example of that. You kind of lost me. Give me an example of that. So it's like, uh, you know, my, my, me saying, oh, my, my, my family's my entire life. And then, uh, right. you know, it's, I think that kind of breeds the, the, the insecurity for, for, for a lot of men. Sometimes it's like when, when the wife's leaving to go with their friends, it's like they, they, they get jealous. Like, well, where, where are you going? You're like, you're my whole life, you know, and you, you want to go with your friends all the time, or, you know, you're going to the, gym and, you know, I'm here with the kids. And I think that's because you made that, you know, in your mind that like, Oh, you know, my family's every, every move that I make is to be a good dad. I'm the best dad in the world. Every move that I make is to be a wonderful husband. And I think it just breeds insecurity, man. And it's like, uh, and your kids can feel this. They can see this. If you give them every single thing they want, like you said, putting them to bed, there's people who watch to say, well, I would put the kids to bed and then I would work out. I would. Sometimes I would. you do. That's exactly. That's it. And sometimes you do. And sometimes, don't. but what happens is your boys they respect that you're a man and that there's shit that you have to do sometimes and that's real life real life isn't being able to hold their hand all the time that's not how it works but what they'll see is hey you know my dad's always there and i know that i can always depend on him but he gets shit done you know he's not a pussy yep. he's not he doesn't just cater to us he's a fucking good dad and he he kills it for us but he kills it for himself too because he's awesome you know he's not like you said this fat slob that's like a pushover that uh you don't respect you know and then when, when they when the kids get older then you know, they it, that's they, they become these these kids like dads or, or their moms that just get walked on or you know they they expect they expect uh they have entitlement because they think i give everything to this it should be all given back to me just the same it just yep. doesn't work like that it doesn't work like that you know what i mean you're you, you have to be a fine-tuned machine you know what i mean you have to take care of yourself physically mentally you know what i mean you do, do you talk to the boys about nutrition my my boys no the 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 the, the tribe the pedago oh, tribe yeah. oh yeah all of them so it's like uh so don't 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 like the whole belly hammer don't don't let him like fool you guys these guys are young still so sometimes they're able when they're training for specific competitions when they pick up couch i don't know if you know about what he did this weekend but uh there was a i don't inter- so the basically one of the biggest eight men tournaments in the world they had this weekend. Uh, Flow Grappling did it at the Who's Number One Grand Prix, and uh, there was a 185 pound division. And they called. They kept losing people, kept losing people, and they called Jacob Couch on Sunday and said, hey, "We need this spot filled for first place. It's thirty thousand. Second place, fifteen. Uh, third place, seventy five hundred. So it doesn't sound like much to a lot of people uh, listening out there." 21 years old so it's a it's a pretty good chunk of change and what what it does for them it's not about prize money what it does for them is it raises their stock to where their dvd sells and their gyms later it really means something so that that the, the title is the big thing the money's never the big thing it's just you know the the the, the, the brand value for sure definitely and it, it would it's raised actually uh by this so they call jacob he's about 250 pounds on sunday so then they say, hey, the weigh-in's going to be ready. He needs to be 185. So this opportunity for him is so big. 
that I ask you, you're going to have ranked guy in the world the first round. Um, you got to cut 30 pounds. Can you cut? Can you? Can you? We cut the 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 30 pounds in four days, and then he says, "Yeah, absolutely, I can do it, and I'll win." So, cuts about 20 29 pounds is what he cut. He weighs in on Friday. His first match was Roberto. He's a number two ranked uh, guy at 185 in the world, and Couch seized this opportunity, and he did this guy, and it just, it, it, yeah, it was amazing. It was such an incredible thing. Uh, Were you uh, there? Did you go to it? Yeah, of course. If they're competing, it's uh, it's very very rare that that, that I'm uh, that, that I'm here. Um, it's a, it's a, actually it's a, a I barely missed it my entire life. I have a list. I was kind of saying this earlier, but uh, I have a list when people people say, say we have sixty five people sign up at a tournament, and uh, this this was a different type of tournament. It was invite only for couch. It's a very prestigious. It's the best guys in the world, and uh, uh, so if I have a list of seventy people, I coach. All 70 people from the time that tournament starts to the time. And sometimes I just forget to drink water. And sometimes these last five days. So the difference between I, myself and the coaches from a lot of the other teams is they might coach their five or six people, but I coach every person, every second. I don't want anyone out there. If I'm not, I want them to look over and see me, the team, all the whole teams on the barrier. It's not two or three people. It's literally if there's 50 of us out there, then 48 of them are out there on the they're the loudest team. They're they're really they're just so behind each other. It's almost intimidating to the other teams. You know what I mean? It's just they're so they care so much about each other winning that it just it, it, it makes this environment that's like uh it's just so positive and happy, man. And it's so much easier to be successful when you have so many people behind you. You know, you you're tired or whatever, and you look over. And it, the same thing just uh, in life in general. You know, when you have so many people rooting for you and that want you to do good and want you to be successful, it's hard to fail. It's hard How did he end up doing in the tournament? So he first he he actually got third place. And, awesome. Uh, yeah. No, he didn't. Man, it's like so he wasn't even supposed to be there. So he got seventy five hundred bucks. Yeah, plus a thousand dollars submission bonus. And let me tell you what what type of guy Jacob Patch is. He's what so is incredible. what is flow grappling? Before you tell me about Jacob Patch, what, what it, it, I thought it was a media company. They actually put on events too. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so what happens is so Flow Sports is the name of the company, and then there's like different uh, there's like Flow Racing, Flow Track, and what it was for was uh like. When, when, when your boys get into college and they run track, you might not fly all over the world not watch them. ESPN's not going to cover it. It's just not big enough. So what happens is you uh, you buy the subscription and watch the, 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 the kids track meets all over the place, you know, while you're at work. Or, you know, so the, flow, gra flow sports covers like smaller sports where like – Yeah. Where e – okay, okay, got it, got so it. Flow, and so yeah. then they ended, up, they ended up putting on their own tournaments. They found that oh. – so flow wrestling was the first one and it's really big, you know, and it's like, uh, you know, like, uh, say, say, say a million followers or whatever. And uh, <clears throat> by followers, it's, these aren't really people in the sport. Anyone who follows it is like, usually they do it. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not like something else where something will have, say Joe Rogan, he'll have a hundred million followers to where maybe 5 million people watch every show. And they're like, so, so this, uh, for flow grappling, if someone subscribes to it, they're, a, you know what I mean? They're, they're hardcore they're, practitioner, de so dedicated. It, they might have 1 million only, but they have 1 million dedicated loyal fans. Yeah, I get it. So it's almost like 10 times that. So you, you understand, you get it. It's not, no one's just clicking the like button because it's that someone sent them a request to, to, to like their page. It's like right. people loyal. So yeah, they, they put on these, uh, they put on these shows, uh, these tournaments and they're really, really professional and really high class. I and mean, they, they, they treat the guy. It's a, it's a real treat. Them up in these like five star hotels and they, they dude thirty thousand dollars is more than some you a lot of UFC fighters get. Boxers oh, get and, and a talking, lot more. Yeah, for sure. I'm not just grappling. You know, what I mean, he's just he went out. Oh, you had you you win three matches and uh, you know it's not as simple as that. But uh, yeah, thirty thousand dollars. Then what it does to your brand, like. Huge. Some of these guys, uh, they're, they're making they're making videos like uh, Andrew, Andrew Wiltsy from the videos. He was kind of the star from the first couple of Daisy Freshes. The yep. you know, lives live in the box. He uh, he probably has a few hundred thousand dollars now from his uh, from from his videos. Uh, 
uh, they do uh, BGG Fanatics is the name of the company, and, and, and he'll do instructional videos. And uh, the people buy, you like teach, you know, they're like tutorials. They That's do. his? Andrew's company is BJJ Fanatics? No. No, no, they, they, he just had a deal with BGJ Fanatics. Oh, okay, okay. So what they do is say, say just in his example, say, they would say, uh, like, Savan's going to uh, do, do his uh, tutorial on how to be the, you know, the best podcast guy in the world, and people would buy it, and then say, the deals are to say, Fanatics would keep half, and you, you would keep the other half. And uh, they, they do all the work. You just film it, and then they should check uh, one, once a month or whatever. And Andrew was born. He was born to to do that. He's an amazing instructor. Uh, he's, I, I could show him an entire system of stuff. And the next day he would come back and say, Hey, I added this and I did this and I tweaked this. He's just amazing. Uh, so he's your he first was, black belt. He's the first person you ever gave a black belt to. Keith? So Andrew, and my first belt that I ever had, and I only have, uh, that I've ever given out. No, actually all of those guys, they won the pins and the, the world championships at every belt all the way up to black. So, uh, I've, I've been, Holy shit! So I've been, been really fortunate with that. Now, a really tight ship, tight program. You know, it's uh when, when it comes to like um uh me, me, me giving the belts uh, away. It's uh we we there's no like charging or anything like that. It's just when they're ready for it. You know, and there's like and uh in the culture that I've created there, no one asks for the belts. They're not even curious to when they're gonna get the next thing. They just know, hey, when it's time for you to get this, you get it. You know, it's like. It's not something really anybody talks about, or you look forward to it, obviously, I'm sure, but it's just there's a really high bar, and it's a really appreciated and respected thing, and all the guys are really happy to – uh and fortunately in our sport, a lot of people are part of, like, association schools, and they'll have a seminar, say, and they'll pay this guy that they've never met to come in and the stripes away, the belts away after so many weeks. Kids, it's a little different, but, uh, you know, with the adults, it's like – I'm not really interested in getting a belt from someone I've never met before. I could care less about that guy tying it around my waist. He doesn't even know me. Uh, so me giving him money and, and, and fighting for him when I've never even met the guy, I just, uh, that, that, that's kind of a, a big thing. And, and unfortunately it's still like a flaw, I think as people, you know, they don't know these guys and they, they've kind of been duped into, uh, you know, like thinking like uh, since the person laid the, you know, like I appreciate everyone who's ever done anything in jiu-jitsu in the past 30 years to make it what it is today. You know, the they're the, the pioneers, you know, they, they, they laid down the railroad, you know, they, they put the sweat in from nothing. But, uh, you know, I did that. I did that as well. You know what I mean? So I appreciate them and I respect them, but it's, it's not, I'm not going to put a picture of them up in the gym and have everyone bow to it and not pretend well, that's, uh, you know, uh, and I'm not going to pay someone a uh, thousand name i just build this shit myself you know well I, I i i respect and appreciate what they've done i'll just i'll do the same thing um when you see people like andrew get money do you ever get concerned uh and th i don't know if this is going to resonate with a lot of people but this is some real shit i'm about to say managing objects is a skill and it's a very, very deep skill. It, you basically, in order to have, there's this Taoist saying to receive everything, give, give everything up. I know people look at people like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, or they think like, we all know people who like, they have a, a baseball hat collection of 40, 40 hats and it's too much for them. It drives them fucking crazy. Basically, you have to be a fucking Buddhist monk if you're going to be wealthy and own a lot of shit. You have yeah. to be willing to let shit come and w let shit go. You can't let it. You can't. If you buy a brand new car and a rock pops up and cracks the windshield and you get upset, you probably shouldn't have that car. That no, life I is about being happy and accepting the impermanence of objects, and that can be very, very difficult for people who come from not having and then all of a sudden getting a lot. Like they sure. they try to protect all their objects, and you can't protect your objects. You cannot. Is, is, do you see any of that with your people that they struggle all of a sudden like they have a new pair of pants and they're acting weird about it or they get a car like they buy their first used car, Honda Civic and they're freaking out because it got a scratch on the door shit like that so I, I'm really lucky like uh, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're pretty I, I was a pretty new black belt I've only had it for a couple of years and we're, we're we're the youngest especially big team or like uh, you know like uh, we're famous but uh, you know the, you're famous the so the the we're definitely 
by far the youngest. We're like the babies out of all, all those teams, you know, and the, the moves that we're making are big moves and they're, they're, they're coming so fast. It's like, uh, you know, yeah. How do you manage that? Uh, didn't really this part of it, the mental part, the infighting, how come he got a new belt? How come he gets a little more money? How come, how come those girls like him? I mean, that shit, people have struggled. That's a, that struggle is real. Yeah. I think it comes from the top. I just nipped that shit in the butt from the beginning. And I'm really open with everyone about how I feel about that at the gym. And I just tell them, you know, I say a lot, you know, I don't know that I think, I think there's a lot of bitch assness and the way that you feel about that. Maybe this just isn't the place for you. You know what I mean? I just, uh, I, I love and appreciate every person's at the gym, but they, they, if they need to want to be there a hundred percent, you know what I mean? And I'm not saying it's my way or the highway either. And really, I mean that it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's all of, it's all of ours together. Pedigo submission fighting, the Daisy fresh crew. That's all of us. It's not just me. I might be the leader, but they're all just as much a part of the time. And, uh, dude, you, you just have, and to they need a leader. They need a leader. Sure. Everyone needs a leader. There's really, really strong people like me, and I still look for a leader. That's how strong I am because I look for a leader, and I assign someone to be my leader. Yeah. Everyone needs a fucking leader. I, 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 I'm a firm believer in that. I just think it goes back to, like you said, the animal instinct thing, man. You know what I mean? It's always just like it's uh, you know, b being a part of a tribe you know, or whatever, you know, whatever it is that we, we, we came from or were uh, – it's – it's tough to just be out there walking around in the woods by yourself. You know why, if there could be 10 of you, why not? You know what I mean? It's like, uh, instead of fighting over one deer that you, know, you, that you could have it for yourself for a month, but if you can get a system down to where there's 10 of you and you can get a factory line going and, you know, then it's easy, uh, you know, but you, you got to get to that point. And, uh, so to answer the question about Andrew, actually, we'll use him as an example. He, um, so first, let, 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 let me let me tell everybody this. Andrew slept on the mat for 10 years with a sheet and a pillow. And he busted his ass and he never had anything by choice. That was his choice. So a lot of people would say like, oh, man, you know, that I'd love to. I'd love to just train at the gym every day and not have to work. So it's a 105 uh, South uh, 7th Street. If they want to come in and do that, they can do that. So instead of talking shit, just do it. You know, instead of like, you know, cutting someone down and saying, oh, man, the guy's doing this. He put his time in. He busted his ass. He spent every penny that he ever earned and worked for and invested in himself and in the team. So now it, it, it paid dividends for him. You know, he uh, he got his first check and he told me I got to get a car. He's never had a car to come here. He sold us. He never had a car since then. Uh, a, a guy donated them one time it was like an old shit box it got them around for a little bit and then finally it blew up i think it caught on fire and blew up but uh they um so his first big purchase he makes he walks there's a car dealership pretty much right the street from the gym and uh he gets his third check and he takes thirty thousand dollars over there and he tells the guy i'd like to buy the white car and uh they're like you know which white car and he's like oh the one toyota it says it's twenty nine thousand, and he lays the thirty thousand dollars out on the table and the guy's like uh i'll have we, we don't do that. That's not the way that it works. You know, it's like, you know, this isn't one of those like little used ships where the guys are like, Oh, this is perfect. You know, it's like a big, uh, Toyota dealership. So it was just kind of funny to, to, to see him do that, you know, to make like an adult purchase because three months prior to that, he didn't have a bank account. You know, he never had one before. And then, um, and episode he, five, he can't get the hotel room. He's in a fit. Someone gets him a fancy hotel room and he can't get in the room because they ask for a credit card and a debit or a debit card. And he looks, he's like looking around like you talking to me. Yeah, exactly. So he, he had, he had no idea. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, part of that stuff came the, the type of family. That he's he a real live monk. You, he's a real live monk. Yeah, no, he, he, he really is, man. And he's, uh, he, even when he, you're, you're going to love this, uh, he later on, so he's finally bought a house. And for the first couple of months, he, he, he buys the house and houses are much cheaper here where we're at. Like the, the house that you live in in California right now, say, say it's just a, a, a small three bedroom, normal house, you know? So in California, these houses are selling for six hundred ninety seven hundred thousand dollars and Mount Vernon, you could buy the same house for 30 grand. You know wow. I mean? So, so uh, the house that I live in, it's a three, four bedroom house. There's a pond outside. It's a, wonderful neighborhood there's a judge that lives two doors down now i lived in the projects five years ago but i rent this house for 150 bucks so, wow yeah there's a big difference there's a big difference between 
Uh, I could rent my house for eight hundred a night. Exactly. That, that's what I'm saying. So that, and it's that, not even a nice house. <laughs> so I, I didn't know this, man. I had a I had a friend, uh, uh, Orlando Sanchez, was, and he had, he had me come over to his house, and he told me, "Yeah, I I, I, I put my house up for sale or sell on this." He's in Pasadena, and he told me it's a <laughs> I, I, I got six hundred ninety thousand dollars for the house, and I was like, "Oh shit, you own the whole block?" And then he told me, <laughs> "No." no this, this, not that it wasn't a nice place. I'm just saying, you know, it was a good, uh, you know, working class family house. And it's a, it's mind blowing. California, it's, it's not like people are making any more money necessarily than, uh, right. You know, right. Like I'm talking about working class people working, like, even if you talk, you know, it's like they make $14 an hour there, 15. Well, you know, here they make 13. It's not like it's, it's not, you know, a, a $300 a month, not payment on a house and a $400 here that's a fucking big difference so i always the poverty the poverty line for a family of four in santa cruz california is 120,000 a year i think it's kind of you can't even believe it you'd have to but uh it's uh you know if if you type into google uh uh, what's the most dangerous city in illinois and you go down a couple and click on the fbi list mount vernon is at number one on the list right now do you have any uh, rich parents who just drop off their kids um actually i have that the rich that drop them off and uh poor ones that leave them they drop them off and sometimes they won't come back and uh, it's they are they're using it for babysitting instead of uh uh so uh, uh, a little while back i had a kid uh, he would get dropped off and he, he would he would kind of sit out front and uh it's a really oriented place like there's always like 20 kids playing out front it's really cool you could come and train and your kids could play out front it's extremely safe and the community knows that it's there you know the cars drive by slow and it's like uh there's a big part but uh but uh sometimes they would come off man and uh he he was really embarrassed he he wouldn't uh sometimes they wouldn't come back and get him and someone would take him home and one time uh, i told him look buddy i'll take you home and he wanted me to drop him off blocks away from where his house was so i just went up to the door and he was praying and upset and i just went in the house told you know to tell him hey uh you got to pick him up we're not babysitting him and the parents are in there shooting up dope and heroin and they're like all they're they're all fucked up you know what i mean and uh he obviously didn't want me to see that that's embarrassing for him and tough for him and uh so we get both man we 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 get both the uh, people who are coming in and you know uh you know, sometimes they, but regardless, the kids there, that's all that matters to me. I don't give a shit if they're using it for babysitting or not. Then I just have to figure out how can I help him get out of this situation? It's not like you can, listen, I would love to just take the kid and take him home with me and just raise him. You know what I mean? I would, if, if I, w- I wish that I had the finances to take every single one of them. If I could, you know this now, you've got boys. If I could have a hundred boys. Yep. That, yep. Well, they could just all grow up there. That would be amazing, but that's not going to that's not real life. It's not the way it yep. is. So yep. I'm always constantly trying to figure out what do I do or what can you do to help these situations, you know? And then uh, what usually happens, unfortunately, is they stop showing up. You know, their parents will stop bringing them. It's too far for them to walk. Uh, the other guys from the gym, they can't just go and get them all the time. You know what I mean? You know, they, they work, they go to school, they have lives too. It's not a uh, you know what I mean? And and even if, if you're doing it with one, you can't do it with 20. It's just not possible to do, you know, and try to work with the city a little bit about, you know, and that's getting better. It's getting much better. Like uh, they just had called me in. It's called the downtown development center. And they had sat us down and they told us, look, we watched this Daisy Fresh thing. And you guys are, you, you guys are uh, superstars in Japan. And you guys are superstars to these jujitsu people in New York. California, but in Mount Vernon, you're still relatively unknown and people have no idea. It's like, uh, and they told us, look, the community's kind of let you down and we want to help. We want to help you get a bigger play help with a lot of this stuff you're hoping with. And man, it was, uh, what if they uh, ruin you? What if they pussify you? What if they ruin you? Well, I guess that's on me. So, so I, we, I don't think we have to worry about that. I think, well, I, okay, I, I, good. I, I keep it pretty, pretty, pretty hardcore when it comes to literally, I'm very lucky, uh, so when it comes to I and people say this, they say it their whole life, but they don't mean it. I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks or what anybody says. I I have a, a Facebook, but like boys told me recently, did you know that you have an Instagram that has twenty thousand people on it? I don't even know what that is. I didn't even know what it was. 
I, I've still I've never looked at it one time in my entire life. The boys run all that stuff for me. I could give it a shit. If someone's going to watch this and they're going to say, hey, that's an asshole. That doesn't mean anything to me at all. I could care less about uh, any of that. It's all about being able to reach as many people as I can, change as many lives as I can, and keep shit real for myself. Because fuck a million dollars when you can leave a legacy that lasts forever. That's the way that I feel about it. I can sell out. Any, I have people reaching out right now from the community. There's a lot of, I think this is with every sport too, in, in every situation. You get a lot of rich guys, like wealthy guys, that for them to donk off a couple hundred thousand dollars is jack shit. And it's like giving the kids 40 bucks, you know, especially these guys in like Dubai and places like this. Yeah. These guys will reach out and they'll say, hey, we'll give you $50,000 or $100,000. We just want to buy you a team and we want to. So that would be easy. It would be easy for me to say, hey, let me take this money. I could change a lot of lives with that. But what I would do is I would ruin everything that we've ever, uh, that, that I've worked for my entire life. Everything that these boys, they have this shit tattooed on them. I would, I would take that away from them. You know what I mean? This, this, uh, the, by taking that money and someone else be involved, it's not, they don't want, what, what I want, but they don't see what I see. That vision would be completely ruined by by adding up. Uh, by, by ruined. Letting... It would. It would be completely ruined. destroyed. And at the end of the day, I might have uh, a new car and a new house and maybe a couple of the boys, but what about the other thousands that are going to come to me over the next 20 years? They would lose everything. They would lose their opportunity. They are going to have programs that themselves one day. They're going to save thousands of people. So by every dollar that I would take from anyone who didn't want the vision exactly the way that I want it, it, it would take away from another thousand people. That's how I look at it. So it's easier to just struggle a little bit and uh, know that, that, you know, uh, I'm changing the world, even if it's just one or two people at a time or, you know, like, like being on your show, you know, a certain person hears this and they say, man, this guy's right about the, the family thing, you know, being a fat slob. And I've been doing this. I can change it around right now. They will change their kids' lives forever. Their kids will grow up and be better moms, better dads, better humans, better friends. And that's the shit that matters to me. That's what's important. I could have sold this shit out a long time ago, especially now with the show. And um, it's what what's the point? What does it matter if you're laying in bed every night and you have the nicest shit in the world? What does it matter? If it doesn't mean anything, you know what I mean? It's There's no point. The legacy is everything. And it's always been everything to me from the time. I never had anything. I've never had anything my whole life. Even everything that I have now, I just give back. What, what What's the, I mean, uh, my life's probably half over. That's the way that I look at it. You know what I mean? It's like, right. uh, so, what, you know, why why do that now? You know, why, why give away everything that's ever been worked for? And that all these guys and girls that, that have believed in me and listened to me and trusted me, why sell anything now when uh, they believed in me? You know, I would I would be a complete fraud if uh, if if I took that and did that. And uh, you know, I already know I'll probably die doing exactly what I'm doing the exact way I'm doing it. And sometimes I look at it and say, you know, there's a lot of struggle there, but at the end of the day, it's worth it. And my boys and the people, my by my kids, my children, and the people who are around me, it, it's they'll know I kept it real my whole life and it's going to change things. It's going to, they're going to help change people. And it's going to, that, that's a trickle down effect. And, uh, that's, that's, it, it's easy for me to do it, man. It's, it, it's simple to, 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 to do that for me just because of that reason at all. I have no, and money dude, money comes and goes, you get money, fuck it. You just spend it anyway. What are you going to do? I'm, I'm, I'm going to bury it in a can or put it in the bank and it's going to sit there. You need money to make shit happen. But when you do all the shit you're supposed to do in life and you're a really good human and you give back, this shit all works out, man. Um, are there any girls in the gym? Any women, so, female? So right now, we have like girls that, that, that have came in and there's always been like a, a women who are a part of it. But now for the first time, we're starting to get competition. Like there. Uh, I had actually in the past, I, 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 uh, I wouldn't have any of the females that wanted to come from other places. Gym. And and uh, um, I'm regretful in, in this for honestly just putting putting all cards on the table. I, I didn't really know exactly what to do. Uh, having 20 guys living, one female come from somewhere else that I don't know and insane, it, insane. I, right, right. And you didn't. Like, you shouldn't regret anything. Men are capable of anything sexually. Men should never be. Tr tr I don't know if trusted is the right word, but 
But I, I, I don't think less of you for keeping the women out, not because they're women, but because of the men. It has nothing to do with the women. It has to do with yeah, the men. Sure. And it was always that in my mind. Just like, and I, I, uh, sometimes I look back on it at times that I hope that there was never a situation to where I, I took something away from, from uh, or I wasn't able to give to, it's, you know, like a, a female that needed to come and stay. But it's just, I just, uh, I need them to be separated, obviously, in living conditions. I mean, I doesn't even really need an explanation. I don't think everyone just no. gets that. You know, you know these, some, some of these are. Dude, it has nothing to do with what's right and wrong and what's fair and not fair. It's understanding what men are capable of. It's just understanding men. It's like a knife. It's sharp. It's no one's fault. It's, it's, there's nothing to blame. There's nothing to understand or not understand. Knives are used for cutting things. Do you know what young boys are used for? And if you don't know, then you should know. There's just one thing. And, 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 and you're at, you should not, you should not fuck with that thing. Yes. Yeah, so Sorry, uh, go ahead. No, no, no. And, and I was, I was just kind of kept it like that. And I, and I wanted to build. So for the very first time, actually, we have a really, really good, it's brand new, like a, a, a women's program. So any, any, uh, female always could train. We've always had girls, you know, and women that are in the classes, but, uh, right now there's like a, a group and I, I never want to separate them. I see a lot of, I see a lot of, that's cool. But uh, I always want to keep everyone together, man. You know what I mean? I want the girls to train with the guys. And, you know, it's uh, a th that's always been important. To not, I don't, I've never wanted to separate them and say like, hey, and uh, and I'm always open to uh, I'm always open to criticism to make things better because I'm, I'm just it's such an intimate sport. It's crazy. My boys, half the girls in the class are girls and half are boys. And I know they're only four and six. But man, that's some intimate shit. I mean, yeah. even with the boys and boys, I mean, jujitsu is a fucking intimate sport. For sure. No doubt. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and like I said, I'm just learning, but we, we really have our first females, they're white belts and uh, they're, they're, they're competing now, you know, and they're, they're tearing it up. They're doing just like the guys they are doing great. And it's, uh, I have a lot of older uh, women, a lot, a lot of like uh, uh, same thing, you know, I always use the, the divorce thing. You know what I mean? Like the, the people that are in their mid thirties and uh, a lot of people look at kids and they're like, man, kids need help and they're lost. And, the thing is that people forget about the, you know, people in their mid thirties that have spent their last 15 years with a, a guy or a girl. And then when they get divorced. They're so fucking lost, man. And they're so alone. And they, you know, it's like just them and their kids and they, they don't know what to do. And, you know, they've dedicated their lives to their family. We, I get this a lot. You know, people come in and they just need to be a part of something. They need support and they need, you know, they, they're, they're looking for something. And uh, we get this a lot, man. And it, it, I think it all just comes back to, like I said, people are just looking to be loyal to something and have, have loyal, to, you know, giving back to them. That's a word that is uh, loosely used and unfortunately advantage of a lot of time. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, so, uh, but um, I, I'm really excited for a women's program to grow, uh, you know, to, to get bigger i'm almost we're, we're just getting there man i'm like i just think a few months away from getting a new gym and then um we almost have enough females now where they're talking about getting out like a, a fight so we have a few fighter houses now it's like some of the like the hillbilly hammer and then some of these guys have moved out of the gym and now that you know there's like you know seven it, i don't want to say frat houses but you know like a bu bunch of a bunch of young guys living together you know they, they kind of can all throw in and have a have a big house so there's almost enough females now where they're going to be able to do that and uh you know what i mean uh, to, to, to have some stuff so i'm really excited for that for grow and uh it just keeps getting bigger man bigger and better and uh um you know because you know guys like you and having us on podcast and uh uh you know just uh, get getting the name out there you know and uh letting us share the story you know it's uh it, 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 it's it's constantly growing and i think it's getting better and we're just going to be able to keep changing lives. And that's, that's my plan anyway. Are you guys selling anything like shirts or stickers or. Yes. In 20 years, people have asked me for 20 years about shirts. We actually just did our first shirt drop and it's a, uh, it only lasted three days, but uh, we're going to start. Uh, I, I got a, bought a website, daisyfreshusa.com. There's nothing on there right now. Let's do like a, I do a drop that was there for three days and we sold about 1000 shirts in three days. So that was really cool. <laughs> I fucking love it. So it was a little tougher than I thought, you know what I mean? It's like, so I, we didn't really think ahead. You know, we thought maybe we'd sell a couple hundred and at a thousand, actually I closed it because uh, we just individually pack, uh, we, we just individually packed each one of them. And uh, yes, we've got, we've got these old, uh, these uh, Christmas, they let us, the post office let us buy these uh, old Santa Claus. He's drinking a Coke and uh, sent them out. And that is kind of funny. It actually kind of goes with the whole show anyway, but uh 
yeah, we, uh, we just individually wrote them by hand and then sent them out. You know, it took us like two weeks to write them all out and send them all out. And, uh, uh, you know, it was a learning experience for sure, but, you know, it was really humbling to know that that many people wanted to, uh, you know, support, and, uh, man, the, the show is huge. It has millions and millions of views, uh, that, you know, for, uh, and you tons know. of spinoffs. There's so many spinoffs, and there's going to be so many more spinoffs. It's crazy. And it, it, it's a, just an um, it's an unapologetic, real, gritty. It's uh, when you jujitsu or just whatever. I mean, like reality TV in general. It's like you know everything is kind of like pushed on there to have like drama and or whatever. You know, you got to sell shit. I get it. It is what it is. Just real, man. And I think the 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 reason it done so well is because so many people can relate to it. It's like at a tournament, there are guys, these really famous guys, they're unapproachable. They're just unapproachable humans. You're like, not because physically how they look. It's not because they look like big NFL guys that are ripped. It's just because maybe a certain arrogance, or maybe they have an air about them that's just, they're just unapproachable. But us, like the Hillbilly Hammer, anyone can walk up to this guy and talk to him. And let, let me tell you what he did this weekend. He wins the money. He he gets the uh, the place match he wins it for seventy five hundred dollars and you get a thousand dollar submission bonus and the guy that he had lost to he got hurt in their match so he like hurt himself to beat jacob and he couldn't do it so jacob got to go on and win third place match so jacob takes his money and he tells the guy a thousand i got that submission match to him because he got hurt and jacob shows me later in his bank account he has negative one dollar that's no bullshit so he he donates the money that he won to this guy who got his knee hurt, and and he told me after he asked me, hey, he he thought like to I'd like to do something, I'd like to to give something away. I said, yeah, of course, brother, it's yours. You know, it's uh, um, Jacob didn't have a dad, and his grandmother raised him. So for a lot of these guys, I'm like their dad. You Dude, know? that's an incredible story. And he uh, so if if you if you get on a uh, Flow Grappling's Instagram, they put it on there. You can see him. Uh, and he makes the, the speech on there and says, hey, to John Blank, I'd like to give him give him the money. And uh, I, I think John Blank actually told him no, that, you know, to, to keep it. He's a wonderful guy. But uh, just the thought, man, for Couch to have nothing and just want to give it back. He's such a happy guy. He wins, he's smiling. He loses, he's smiling. Uh, it's kind of funny. You hear all the other guys talk, and they're like, yeah, man, we're going to kick each other's asses. We're going to be the best. And he just says, like, man i'm just so happy to be here in the hotel room is so nice and i got to ride on the airplane and he's just so excited to just be maybe it's because he has a girlfriend is that his girl in the show uh no no because there is uh, a girl in the show who's like sometimes sitting next to him in the camper and shit oh yeah yeah she, she's uh she, she, she had came down that's not his girlfriend no nope, not his girlfriend they're all they're, they're all just like you know really good friends and hanging out and she came down uh to, to stay oh, that's for a cool. few years. she she'd moved to uh, to to train but uh yeah no it's uh you know, he's got some lady friends or whatever you know uh he, he, he's a young guy but uh man he he's just such a such a fucking cool kid man he's just so happy man I, and I, i'm so proud of him for uh just you know like he never loses focus uh, uh on on just just being cool dude he's just such a, a approachable nice guy man and it's like all these kids asking him for autographs this weekend. It was so amazing to see him come from what he's came from. And, uh, you know, it is it, really amazing for me to see that, man. I'm so proud. What's the youngest kid in your gym? Uh, at a 15 year old, a full time, a 15, like sent him. I think they just kind of didn't want him anymore. And they, they, they sent him down and then he was able to do because of COVID. We got a lot of younger, like 15, 16, 17 year olds, uh, they they would uh they they drop them off and uh uh some of them I think just kind of didn't want them they were able to do school online so I think some of the parents kind of used that as an excuse and that's not all of them some of them are amazing parents you know it's just uh so he, he he's sixteen now so I think sixteen is like the youngest like full time uh uh kid, you know so they have to get up and so some you know some of the kids they live in the gym and they get up. And they go to school, you know, normal. There's no shower in the gym. They shower outside. They have this little, and they take a shower. And uh, it's like, uh, so it, 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 it's tough, but they get up and they go every day. And I tell them, look, if you're not doing this, if you're not doing the things you're supposed to be doing, you can't stay here. You know what I mean? So it's like, uh, 
if, if your grades fall below this, I'm a little rough on them. That, you know, I, I, the standard's really high because I said, look, we're constantly, people are looking for a reason to uh, yep. Yep. shut this down or complain or be jealous, you know, and, and hate on it. So I tell them, you are held to a serious standard on this, man. And they all do wonderful. The older guys help the younger guys. You know, they, they help take them to school and um, they, uh, so now all the kids actually, there's no more kids to stay in the gym now, though. We've, uh, that we got a house to where there's a was a, a teacher he, he runs the place and he 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 had a bunch of rooms so he just some stay there and he helps him with the school stuff and uh he, he he's done really well for himself in, in business and was able to retire early so he's uh he helps all the younger guys out that kind of needed a place to go and uh it's tough there when you uh parents just drop you off and then i think a lot of them realize oh man maybe uh maybe they nope. didn't want around this wasn't just no one sleeps in the gym anymore did i hear that right what did you say about that you know, just uh, just the young kids you know i, I didn't oh really want right the, the younger ones in there uh right so, makes so sense like, hey is any of the polarizing shit that's going on in society come into your gym any of the woke stuff any of the the pro vaccine anti-vaccine um uh, you don't have enough women you don't have enough people of color you don't have enough uh pygmy elves like do you, is any of that shit like, does that get um, into your gym no it's you, it's pretty like online you know like people will see the things and they they, they talk shit but it's it, it's kind of like uh the boys are funny, man. They'll get into the big group and they'll read like the negative comments and then they all just laugh. I've, I've like, uh, I, I've conditioned them to not give a fuck about um, anything that anything anybody says or thinks, you know, with the show on the, the first couple, now, if you go on YouTube now, it's, it's funny, be a thousand comments and 980 of them are wonderful. So that's really rare. You know what I mean? It's like in yep. anything, if you're a cyclist, someone's going to talk shit. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's hard to talk shit about all people are just you know happy and they're doing good and it's like you know giving it's it's kind of tough to touch in on it but yeah you know how it is people can find uh their way luckily enough in southern illinois we live in a place to where it's small enough to you know like covid came and and uh you know it, it didn't really matter man it was just kind of everybody's choice hey if you wanna if you want to do these do them if you don't don't uh we never had masks here ever bro never the restaurants never shut down the, i'm moving to mount vernon i'm moving <laughs> so i won't wear a mask or put a mask on my kids there's no fucking way i would ever do anything to put a mask on a four-year-old child or a six-year-old child I, and i and i think that if you do do that you're a fucking abusive parent who's not thinking clearly and you should pull your head out of your ass you should do 100 burpees and think about it again that's my opinion if you went up to if you went up to uh, chicago though you know it, it, or anything even if you went two hours up in the state illinois is an extremely hardcore um it's a very democratic uh you know like uh they're, they're in control big time up there. So Isn't that funny? They're called Democrats, but they don't do anything that's democratic or with liberty. It's the same in my town, my whole town, everywhere I go, 80% of the people are masked. We, I'm just not doing that. Man, my, I'm not doing my, that. All my friends in California with their gyms, man, I, I, I'm, I'm so, I'm so just, uh, you know, disappointed for them and they've, they've spent their whole lives building, you know, 20 yes. years, and they, so many of them just lost everything, man. It's, uh, you know, Garth I, Taylor Jiu Jitsu survived. That that's when it comes to having a good community too. People really love Garth, and like that place can't fail because it's really our. It's really where my kids go to school. My the Jiu Jitsu gym my kids go to is their school. It's where they're going to meet girls, where they're going to meet boys, where they're going to learn big words, where they're going to learn math, where they're going. I mean, it's everything. They're going to learn discipline. They're going to um, figure out which books to read. So that place can't fail. And the parents yeah, came well, together and threw a lot of money at it to make sure it stayed open. That, that, that's wonderful, man. We're the, so part of, part of the part of the thing about being here and, and being in a small place. Like everyone always says, like, hey, why don't you move to to you know the, to California? You know, you can make a there, there's a Compton in California. We actually have a little uh, a little club that's out there in Hawthorne uh, in California. Wow. You know, the, the guy's a teacher at a, a, a school like a second chance school, like a safe school. So he deals with like you know, like, uh, ex gang bangers and like, uh, it's pretty hardcore where he's, at. uh, he lives for the shit, man. He loves it. His brother's the state's attorney here. So they're like a family that really like gives back to community and, uh, he moved out there. And, uh, it's been really rough on him, man. He had a really great program and was been a lot of kids and making stuff happen. And, uh, it got shut down, unfortunately, kind of with the COVID. And uh, he, he's obviously struggling. He's a school teacher, but, uh, 
at, at one of those schools. But it, man, it's, it's just been so tough on it to, uh, you know, j- j- just to make it. And, uh, and Mount Vernon, with the rent being 500 bucks, I mean, we, we never, never stopped it. You know what I mean? We just kept doing what, you know, life just kept going. And, um, you know, we were, we were lucky that you know, n- n- nobody ever got sick or anything like that. So it was so we just, uh, I, mean, I, I think for like eight months, there wasn't even COVID here. It never even made its way. You know, p- people don't leave there. Uh, you know, they might go to St. Louis shop or something, you know, but for the most point, it's just such a small, small place. And uh, you can call that whatever you want. You know, like people, people in big places might think, oh, like, uh, you know, people think when you're from the Midwest that, you know, you're uh, you know, like you're automatically you're just a dumb redneck that fucks his sister. You know what I mean? It's like. Yeah, that's what they tell us. That's what they tell us in California. I, I you're, you're, you, you have it spot on. So, we're told man. to believe that you guys are dumb, and yeah, that's how we're raised. Everyone in the middle of the country is dumb and doesn't know what they're doing and is, are bad people. And then we man. visit there, and you guys are the nicest people in the world. And we're like, wait a second. Interesting enough, it's really funny. Something I've learned with the, the Jacob Couch, the Hill Hammer Kid, is uh, when people hear his voice they slow the way that they talk down. It's like automatically they think he's like Rain Man. You know what I mean? It's like he has this Kentucky accent, so all of a sudden that he's just this dumb redneck hillbilly. You know what I mean? It's kind of – he's a really sharp kid. It's funny to uh, – and he puts it on. He puts it on thick sometimes. You know what I mean? But uh, it's funny to, to when people hear that immediately in their mind, just think like when someone's from the country, you know, that they're uh, – you know, they're a little slower uh and hey look things are slower here like if, if you uh it's it's funny you know because people say like california is uh you know we're just using that because you're from there it's a really liberal place but it's funny, man the midwest maybe people are uh in, in a lot of places in the midwest i mean you can get hardcore republican type people out here but man for the most part nobody really gives a fuck about what you're doing or you know it's like uh it's and it's kind of funny. It's it's kind of the opposite to what people really think. It's like like in New York City, it's a very very liberal place, you know. But at the same time, by by liberal, the, the, these some of these people are they're the most judgmental people of all. I mean, they think of course if you're not if you're not an incredible person in their mind that's open to everything. Basically, you're just a piece of shit, you know. And like uh, it's just kind of funny, man, with the politics. Uh, and it goes both ways on both sides, you know what I mean? Pe- people are just, they're just so close-minded when it comes to come to things. And in the Midwest, we're really, like, where I'm from anyway, we're really lucky to just have, I don't know, I, I think this is one of the freest places ever be- being here. I just think it's uh, it's small enough to where nobody really cares about what you're doing. Or, you you know. said, when you went to high school, you were saying something like you were like one of seven white kids that, in the beginning of the podcast, something like that. Am I getting that right? Or in your neighborhood? In, in grade school, in grade school, it was like that uh, from from like kindergarten until like sixth or seventh grade. Then once you get into all the other schools, so there were like uh, like seven or eight grade schools, you know. And there's like the the nice grade school was like uh, you know on this part of the town, and then on, on the there's a place called Horseman was the name of it. Nah, uh, it's that, it's just the neighborhood. It's the black neighborhood or the poor it's- neighborhood. Isn't isn't it funny? So your perspective might be similar to mine. When I was 16 years old, I I moved. Uh, my mom kicked me out of the house, and I moved into an apartment building my dad owned, and it was in the Oakland Berkeley border. And I was all of a sudden went from being in a all white neighborhood that was Hell's Angels and meth called Pacheco, California, to an all black neighborhood where I was the only white person except for the Asian dude who lived in the apartment across from me, who dealt heroin to this to the uh, I was going to say strippers to the prostitutes. And I lived in that neighborhood from when I was 16 to when I was 20, and I did everything I could to learn about black culture because I came from white culture. I read everything I could about the Black Panthers, all this shit, blah, 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 blah. And and it was awesome. And it was mostly uh, – even though I was 16 to 20, I mostly hung out – all the black dudes I hung out with were like all ex-cons from Soledad or San Quentin, and they were all in their 40s and 50s. And it was cool, and I would sit out and drink 40s with them, and, and, I, and I got a good, strong education on, on – on on that culture and now we're in this giant we went through just this fucking insane black lives matter movement which is the most disgusting sad abusive thing towards black culture that i've ever seen if you were a black person and you supported black lives matter you uh, uh 
you're I'll be surprised if you can ever wake up because of what you did that hurt your people. It is really, really sad what you've done. You've supported the victocracy. But now 70 percent of the black skinned people are refusing the vaccine. And now all of a sudden black lives don't matter. They won't let you get a job in California unless you're vaccinated. What happened to black lives matter? They never cared about you. They never were interested in you. You were just being used, and, and you nailed it right. I, as a liberal, I was, I was raised to accept everyone, to love everyone, but it's not like that. It's a giant lie. It's just, it's just talk. It's just rhetoric. None of my fr- – no one I know would have lived in that neighborhood that I lived in. No one. And the same thing about homelessness. I was homeless for two years. I'm t- fucking tired of people talking about homelessness. It's 99% of homeless people are fucking drug addicts in California. They're drug addicts. I was homeless for two years. That's who they are. So, like, it's, it's, it's easy to feel sorry for homeless people when you're rich and throw money at it. You're, you are the same people that feed seagulls at the beach, and so we all get shit on. You think you're doing good by feeding the seagulls, but you're not. You're causing the rest of us to get shit on. Sorry. I go on these rants every once in a while. And I just I love people who are actually doing the help for people. And these idiots can sit in their ivory towers and be like, you don't have enough black people at the gym. You don't, you're not following COVID restrictions. Fuck you. He's helping boys who could otherwise be violent criminals and hurt society. Instead, they're going to be contributing leaders. Daisy Fresh, an American jiu-jitsu story. You have to see it. You'll want to rep the brand. It's all good people, loving, supportive people. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm just proud to be a part of all that, man. And I mean – not not bullshit dude it's like what, what a part you- of it you started it you're the leader you're putting your ass on the line man that yeah, documentary listen. makes you guys vulnerable i'm telling yeah. you it makes you vulnerable the, the, the guys and the girls though that they, they've their lives you know as uh maybe not as long as i have but you know that that it's uh i am part of it man maybe i'm the leader and they've given that that responsibility which i'm, I'm really proud to have that uh that, that that title or to be that but i really am just a that, that they they give their lives as much as I do. They've dedicated the things, and maybe it's only been for a year for them or two years. It's been twenty five for me, but that doesn't make me owed anything because no matter what doors I open for them, I'm still just a part of it, man. And I'm hundred percent okay, and that's the way that I want. I I want them to always feel like this is ours and we're doing it together. And it's a shared. It should be a shared feeling. And when uh, you know, uh, it, it, I, I think that that makes more people when they come in and they, they, it's kind of funny. People will come in and they always are kind of a little bit nervous when they're like meeting me to come and train because, uh, you know, at most places, like I said, these guys are in there, the, king of the kingdoms, they don't want the guys to go and train other. They're really, they're really controlling about like, uh, and all it comes down to at the end of the day is, uh, that, that's that word loyalty, you know, it can be used to control and instead of, uh, uh, you should be loyal, but, uh, Controlled, you know what I mean. Uh, be loyal to what you believe in, but not controlled by uh, a system or not controlled by you know other people's thoughts. You know, be loyal to your thoughts and your the things that you want. And uh, you know, I think when you do that, and you don't really give a fuck about anything else. I just think it it, it you you grow a lot more with that that attitude. And uh, I could care less if the guys go they can go and train somewhere for six months if they want. It doesn't matter to me if they want to go. Uh, and they wanted to leave, I would miss, you know, them very much, but if, if I'm happy and it's, uh, it's going to improve their quality of life and, uh, the people who are going to be in their life, man, I'm a hundred percent okay with that. And that's not the, Hey, I have a bunch of other people. So fuck attitude. It's just, I really mean that. I just want them to be happy a lot of times in life that I wasn't happy. And, and I, you know, I, I was looking for things or thought that I needed more things and, uh, you know, maybe didn't appreciate what I did have. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I just think you got to get out there and you got to fail and you got to fail and you fail and then you figure it out. That's the way that you figure it out. Not, not from gifts or, or not, not from, uh, anything else, just that, you know, you know, failure really, really builds, you know, uh, it, it builds, you know what I mean? Like going back to what you said about your boys earlier, they fall down, they get up, you know, and if, uh, if someone's constantly picking you up and, uh, you know, doing it. So, and that's how I am with the gym, man. I, I, I created the environment and opened the door for the environment to give them the opportunity to do that, but they have to do it. You know what I mean? I, 
I created the system, but they're the ones that have to do the hard work. They have to show up. They have to give up partying and, and, you know, chasing girls or guys, they have to give up, uh, uh, you know, the, the, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, the fun things in life to, 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 to maybe be a champion, you know, that's what separates people who are champions in life from people who are just good or people who are, you know, um, a little better than everyone else or something. These are the things that, you know, you know how it is. It'd be great to go out and party all yep. the time. And, but, uh, you know, you got to save your money and you got to use it towards the important things that are going to you know, benefit you in the future. You have to constantly invest in yourself. And that's not just with money. It's with, uh, you know, uh, every move that you make is important. You know what I mean? And it's um, just finding that balance between happiness and, you know, being productive, I think. Are, are, it's, uh, and I've been really lucky. I've kind of been able to figure it out. And, uh, and it was definitely through trial and error. You know, I, I had so much failure and so much... Uh, really any help uh, honestly Savon. it's been uh so the, the help that i've gotten you know it's just it's been through like really those people that s- supported me you know like uh you know like girlfriends or best friends uh, uh a- 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 everything else has just kind of been something i've had to just do and, and uh, not had any idea what the fuck i was doing and just fail and uh figure out okay that's not the way you know start all over and try again start all over and try again and uh you know i think that's with anything though i don't think that's just jujitsu I think that's not just sports. It's uh, everything in general, you know what I mean? Business and, and, and everything. It's just, you know, you figure it out. I think we figure things out as we go along. It's like being a dad. When you find out that you're going to be a dad, it's the most exciting, petrifying thing in the entire world. And when the baby comes out, you are you don't even touch it almost because you're afraid that you're going to hurt it. Or well, what, if you, what if you dropped it? Or what, what if I... What if, <laughs> yep, all that. And then you realize it's not funny. It's why second kids are usually so much tougher than the first yep. kids. It's yep. the, the first one, you know, you, you, the rules and society's told you, hey, you have to do this. And yep. I remember uh, I, I did a tournament and I took took Gavin to to, to a, a tournament when he was like three three weeks old. I had him on an airplane and like people were like complaining. I actually took him out to California and they were, I remember a bunch of people telling me, oh, you should cover him up. You should do this. And, 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 I just remember thinking like they were, they were pussies and thinking about like, uh, back in the day, like, you know, the Indians or the Vikings that were here, they, you know, I doubt that they, that's probably not what they would have done. I'm pretty sure that he'll be okay. And I remember at first kind of trying to take people's advice on, uh, you know, being a dad and raising, just realizing nobody knows what the fuck they're doing, man. They just been told this by someone else that had a kid and it's just trial and error, man. And then when you have this sick, you realize that they're like the most, um, you know, they're, incredible, you know what I mean? Like they're resilient as shit. My kids never wear shoes. My kids never have taken a shot. My kids just, I just don't feed them added sugar or refined carbohydrates as little as possible. I mean, a birthday party here and there. And then, yeah, kids are so resilient. I, I, my kids started wearing shoes for the first time when he started crashing on a skateboard. And he's like, Hey, I think I might need shoes. I'm like, yeah, then now's probably a good time to put some on. And it was like, you know, I, I was a kid in, in, in the 80s, and I think that the, I think the 90s kind of kids were the, the kind of the, the some of the last groups that you're always outside, you know, like, yep. I mean, dude, we, I, I was thinking the other day about these trees at the park was there that we used to climb up in. Man, it, it was scary looking up there now that I'm an adult. I'm like, holy, if we would have fell out of them, we'd have been dead. You know what I mean? It was yep. just like that. Now it was like, uh, you know, there were no kids there at the park. You know, it was like old people walking around. The kids weren't playing. The stuff had like spray paint on it. And it was like, no, no, no one's, they're, they're just not interested a lot of times in like, you know, being outside and, uh, you know, and uh, I think a lot of that just kind of gets handed down, you know, from like the, 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 the parents, you know what I mean? They're like, they're just so scared of things. Everyone's scared. Everyone's so scared. They've ruined their lives. They're, they're, they've, they, they can, and no one can do risk assessment anymore. Yeah, no, for sure. I, 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 I used to run Walmart. It's like, it was across town, like six miles. And I, I mean, it was like, dude, if you let your kid, and I was like five years old, six years old. And it was normal. You know, there, it wasn't just my parents. It was like all the kids in the neighborhood, you know, we would like go and buy baseball cards, whatever they're, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, dude, if you let your kid do that now, you, you would go to jail. I mean, they would put you in jail for, for, for the, you know, you'd be in trouble. You know, it's like, uh, um, it's, Think it's, of all the creeks you swam in. Think of all the crazy shit you did with as kids. 
oh. rocks you threw, creeks you swam in, sh gross shit that they that no one ever does anymore because they're terrified. No, no, it, and it it really is. It's a real thing, man. You know, it's it's and and, and you can tell in society uh, it, it just happens. Like especially coaching with the kids, it's like uh, some of the parents that come in are so pussyfied. And the funny thing is, they want their kids to win. That's all that matters to them. Is you know maybe they do shit in their lives so they want to live through their kids and they want them to be winners and the best and sometimes i don't know if it's for their kid if it's so they can brag and be better it's like it's like high school for them all over again you know what i mean yeah be, i got a little bit of that i'm guilty of a little bit of that i there i didn't dance so i want my kids to dance i didn't fight well i fought but i didn't like i did, wasn't good at it and so i want my kids to be able to fight i, I you know i get it i don't I, think I, I, I don't think wanting them to do something is bad. I, I think that's good. I think, you know, there were times that I would look back with my parents and I would say, man, I wish that they would have been a little bit hard, more hardcore on me with like school. Meaning right. uh, uh, they made sure I was there and they wanted me to go. But, uh, you know, I, maybe, especially with my mom being a teacher, I, I think sometimes to myself, like, you know, uh, I didn't go to college. I went for uh, a semester and I was like, man, this, this, is, this is stupid. I'm not going to do this. Um, the shit that they're teaching me about business. I knew this when I was 10 years old, watching the neighbor guy slim dope. He had a million bucks. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I would think to myself, I, maybe that's the wrong way to look at it, but I would just think some of this shit that I'm learning, it's just not usable in life. You know what I mean? It's like, so I, I always wanted to do jujitsu, you know, and I, I thought in my mind, maybe if I went to school and learned how to do business, it would help a little bit. And that, that lasted no time. There's a, uh, uh, one, one, one of my professors was a really, really hot. So I, I stayed in for the whole semester. But other than yeah. that, that was, uh, that was, uh, I was out b back out in the road, going to California and all these different places to train. A lot of the jujitsu has always been in California. So kind of keep coming back to, to being out there. And um, it was, uh, you know, I, it, I couldn't stay in the gyms for very long. Cause like you said, people are always, you know, I, I saw my friend told me that during the COVID stuff that you guys had, like they were telling on people. And if you told yes. them something, and then you would get a check for telling on them for being open. And it was like, so you, you, first off here where I'm from, you would die for that. People, they, someone would kill you for that. In all seriousness, all jokes aside, it would be like that would not go over it, it, with the people here. But For uh, tattletaling. Yeah, it would not be good. But uh, it's just, I don't know, man. It's just, hey, and do you know why you'd kill them? Because you're trying to keep your doors open so that you can make money, so that you can buy food for your kids. So basically, it, and soon as you do that, as soon as you stop someone from being able to put food on their table for their kids, I, you, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but you should be you know that you've put your life in d danger. Just like, yeah. and like you said, we're wild animals. Like you fuck with a baby elephant, and mama's gonna bury you under a stack of trees so fucking high. For sure, definitely, it's true, and it's not it, that. That's not something I, I don't think that that's uh, that's not an opinion. It's just real. That's just real life. It's just the way it is. So no matter how you feel about politics, at the end of the day, on, on a lot of this stuff, it, it's about survival. You know what I mean? And right. The the, the mental in the in the last uh, in the, in the last two years has just been like it's been so bad for people. And uh, I actually just read. Uh, the murder rate in 2020 was up 30 percent from the rest of the years it actually doubled the worst of before had been 15 percent the highest it's the highest murder rate that we've ever had now think about this with half the country was entirely closed down this whole time for the murder rate to go up on that people weren't even outside it's like i just think do you know what do you know why i think it went up i i i'm so arrogant as i'm gonna say i don't think i know why it went up it went up because those the, the blm movement started hating on cops and cops started engaging people in the ghetto and stopped engaging people with black skin and violent crime skyrocketed. 51% of all murders in the United States in the last fucking 10 years have been committed by people with black skin. Does their skin color have anything to do with it? No, that's someone else's statistic. I don't give a fuck what color skin someone is, but if you're going to use that demographic, if you're going to use those metrics, then you have to realize if you make it so police can't engage those people or someone's going to turn a camera on them and get them in trouble for doing their job, then then police are going to stop engaging them. They're just people. I have tons of friends who are cops, black, white, and other. And it's the black ones, the white ones, and the other ones who are all telling me that if they pull someone, if they pull up next to someone who's doing 85 and a 55 and they're black, they, they have black skin, they go the other way. 
if they see someone like wielding a knife in the middle of the street acting crazy he's black they go the other way when they used to engage them and they don't and they're not engaging anyone in the ghetto and guess who's suffering good fucking honest fucking amazing people who happen to have black skin because these other fucking people have, have made it have made it impossible for cops to do their fucking jobs that's why i think sorry yeah. got another you got another rant out of me no, sorry no, no, no. you know I, I'm, 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 I'm ears open and always trying, just trying to learn about things that you know that if there's some way that i can help the you know just the, the, the world be better i always want to so i'm i'm, I'm always completely open to, to hearing everybody you know uh you know because sometimes we just have our own thoughts you know what i mean it's it's as long as you're willing to open your mind and learn from other people i think you you know you, that, that that's how change is done just by education you know what I mean? it's uh and uh, so 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 me personally i'm i'm always i'm a completely open mind and, pe and, and people say that you know they say shit like like oh, i'm an open book i'm an open man i'm always just trying to learn and and grow because like i said everything that i've done was mostly just through uh trial and error so you know maybe all the shit that i was trying was wrong because that's all i ever knew you know what i mean so i'm uh, i'm always excited to just talk to people especially on other sides of the country you know and like here you know what what's going on some you guys are a completely different literally a different country out there man it's like yes it's, it's nuts here it's, it's nuts like, it's like california chicago uh you know houston dallas and then uh you know new york city and it's, it's kind of how it's split up you know they're like almost like different countries in the world and the people are so different the people so here, different the people in like you know mississippi are so different from the people in california the people have no idea you know what i mean it's like it's if you've never been out the the southern hospitality stuff is all real man that's like real it's uh, yep their attitudes are so different and people are it's like so much happier in these the places uh that uh you know it's a uh, it, it's really wild man like i've been really fortunate to travel with the jiu-jitsu stuff and, and 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 meet and see a lot of different people and it's it's so wild our, our, and our country is such a baby you know it doesn't even really have an identity yet compared to other you know a lot of these other countries have They've been around for thousands and thousands of years. You know, when you really think about it, the United States has been a country for like a hundred years. You know? and it's yeah. Like, we're literally just babies, you know, trying to kind of, you know, trial and error, trying to figure things out. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a, a neat time to, to, to be alive and, 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 and see a lot of the wild stuff that's happening. Matt Murphy in the comments just says, has anyone offered to donate to Daisy Fresh to make it more modern or would he like to keep it old school you know what's interesting matt is in the documentary there's as the documentary progresses and you can see the boys are getting more and more attention um you can see that people have started donating stuff but i'll go ahead and let uh heath talk about that are people donating stuff yeah you know p people all the time they sit they send the boys you know <laughs> those that, that there they uh they, people are so incredible man they're always trying to give you know they're like they're, they'll, they send packages of you know there's like food and different stuff the guys and uh uh, we kind of got a lot of shit for a while. There were, there were a couple, uh, you know, people that are just saying, oh, man, you know, these guys don't work. They're not doing shit. And people are sending them food. A lot of the really big names, like, man, pe people love this show, man. You know, they, they, they know. They see. They, they, they see what's happening. And, uh, you know, it's uh, all, the, all the guys that are there that live there full time, they all either work or they go to school. None of them are just there lay, laying on the mats. Uh, on one of the days, he had a... He, he had a, a food card and people freaked out, man, during that. It was like right when COVID first started and he had, had food stamp. It was like, why are you sending these guys, up? The, you know, these like the welfare babies, you know, and like they're just taking and it's never been like that, man. It's, it's, it's not like that at all. It's um, so, of course, always uh, now the building itself, a lot of people say, okay, why, why not fix up the building? You know, it's like, uh, you know, so I've never ever planned on staying there. You know, it's you can have the most killer, badass pirate ship in the world, but if it has holes in it, there's no point to paint it. You know what I mean? You'd have to fix the holes. And um, so I'm just planning to move. I've got this place, and like I said, we're slowly like closing in on it. And uh, the, there's so so the, the hope is to get this other place that so we can have more you know more classes and. Uh, better stuff for like younger younger groups and like 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 you know like uh, females and all, all stuff it's going to give us a lot more space and a lot more uh you know it was actually a before so it's set up it's like showers and locker rooms and so that uh 
the, the, that, that's the, the plan is to move in there. So it's like sometimes people want to, especially the mats, you know, in, in the show, in the jiu-jitsu community, the, the pedigree submission fighting mats are like the most talked about, feared, disgusted things to people in the world, which is really funny to me. I mean, it's like, but uh, so people always say, hey, you know what, well, maybe, maybe we could make a donation or do something for new mats. But uh, when we get a new place, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get some new mats and we'll, you know, we'll make everything a bit nicer. But I'm just going to keep this shit real. It's always going to be kind of, kind of like hardcore. And I always kind of, kind of want to that old school rough. Uh, there's no heat in there and there's no, there's no condition in there. I like it like that. I prefer to keep it like that. It like, it's, it, it just, it just makes it tough. And uh, there are a lot of people out there that say, uh, especially in the jujitsu community, they'll say like, uh, you don't train like this to, you don't have to live like this to be a world champion. And that's true. That's probably true for a lot of people. But this is the way that we do shit, and we're winning. And not only that, uh, if, if we're not the right now, we're definitely one of the. And so maybe, maybe people should consider. Maybe we do what the fuck we're doing. You know, maybe there's a reason that they're making these shows, and maybe there's a reason that we keep winning and we're success. And, and it's not because there's not uh, heat and air condition. It's because the environment is a tough and man. It's, you know what I mean? It's a uh, I, I, I weed out the people that uh, that, that don't want to be there, and they're not real. It's, it's I don't use the gym to make money. You know what I mean? The gym to build better humans, tough humans. You know, people that are going to be able to create other tough humans. These are tough times to be a little bit tough. And I think I never think you'll be the best version of you unless you hit rock bottom. I don't believe there's any amount of meditation, religious practice. I don't believe there's, there's any you'll, – you'll meet these fucking amazing enlightened people and they'll tell you, no, you don't have to take the path I did and, and have a near-death experience or be suicidal. Bullshit. If you don't hit rock bottom, you will not climb to the highest peaks. You will not. I have not met anyone. I do not know any story of one. Um, and if, if you want you – must, you must experience something very, very <sighs> – I don't know what the word is, but uh, I, 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 I fully support what he's doing. And by the way, I mean, do you think that working at a, at a Budweiser plant is more noble than, um, uh, than doing jujitsu full time and not having a job? I know he said they either go to school or they don't have a job, but so what if they didn't? You think, you think working at the Coca-Cola plant is more noble? You think, you think, oh, I put in 40 hours a week working at 7-Eleven. I deserve more than the guy who's training jujitsu full time. No, you don't. No, you don't. You sell candy and poison to little kids full time. And you make a living out of it. You're, you're not more noble than them. If I, if I want to give money to the guy playing the violin on the corner, that's my fucking business. If I want to give money to the kids who are practicing jiu-jitsu and, and growing up to be strong men, good husbands and good fathers, that's my business. Fuck you. I think working at Coca-Cola makes you a piece of shit. How's that? And there's it, half the country does shit that peddles poison. No, no, so there. Good. Those people can eat a dick. Yeah, no, that's kind of how it's been. Like I said, I, I think it's funny, you know, so like I said, uh, I, I, I found they conditioned the boys because it, it wouldn't matter, you know, especially the, the, the Hillbilly kid, he would, man, he would get his feelings hurt. People would say something mean about him and he'd come and show me. And uh, at first I'd kind of blow him off say, Jacob, what do you care about what, what some that guy in Oklahoma says that doesn't, you're never going to meet this guy, who cares? And then uh, that approach really worked. And he'd never say it to your face. And he'd never say it to your face and he's jealous. But go on, sorry. No, no. The, I always tell, that's what I always tell the guys. They say, oh, you know, uh, you know, they'll say, yeah, fuck Heath, whatever, for this and that. And, you know, he's like leading the, these kids the wrong way. And I was just telling look, man, I'm at all these places. If someone wants to say something, they can come up and say it. I could care less. Literally, I could literally care less about what anybody thinks or how they feel. As long as those kids are happy and they're growing, they're going to be successful. And I mean this shit about the happiness thing dude it's the most important thing of all just being happy life is so short if you're yeah not what makes you happy you know what i mean then you're you doomed it's just uh and 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 i think people are searching for the wrong things up they think the wrong shit's gonna make them happy you know they think like a woman is gonna make them happy or they think that you know that the only thing that can make them happy or money or uh, you know, having a nice car or nice ship and at the end of the day, if you don't make yourself happy, you can't make anyone else happy. You think that your mm. kids, you know, when your kids are little, they know everything about you. They watch every move you make. They know when you're sad. They know when, and you can tell 
when you're not having a good day, your kid will crawl up there on your lap. They know they can feel your energy constantly all the time. And that's how I feel with the, the kids in the gym. They know. So it's important for me. Sometimes I have to be a little selfish. I have to take the time to do things that make me happy. I'm lucky because that's what makes me happy. But uh, just be, just try to be cool and be happy, man. It's literally life is that simple. If everyone could just do that, care a little less about other things, care about yourself a little bit more, and just be happy and be cool, man. And then it was like that's what California originally was. You know what I mean? It's like when when, when you look back. I think that's that's California was the coolest place, like the 60s and 70s when it's like starting up. That was the place where you could go and no one gives a fuck, you know, and if you wanted to go out there and do drugs, you could go out there and do drugs. You could just be happy and no, no one would no one would fucking judge you about this or that. You know, you could just do your thing. And then, you know, then all these rules came along and all these like just judgmental. Uh, there's just so much, stuff, you know what I mean? And it, it, it kind of. Now it's kind of switched. It's like it's a uh, California was the most, you know, like liberal place in the world. Now it's almost like uh, it's almost opposite. It's like the most judgmental place in the world. If you don't agree with someone out there, you're a piece of shit. You know what I mean? And, and not just California. Not not to bag. I love California. No, no, I hear you. You're 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 speaking I'm correct. You're, you're from there, so so you get it. It's just uh, you 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 just have to. You know what I mean? Some, some I think just just be cool. Just be cool and be happy. And if, if everyone could just have that fucking that mindset, shit would just be so much better, man. It's so incredible. And uh, everyone in California should be happy. They live in the most beautiful place on earth. It's so beautiful here. And, and maybe sometimes I've actually bagged California in one of the Daisy Fresh episodes, and they were really upset about this, man. I was just breaking balls anyway. But uh, <laughs> I said, how tough can someone be if it's 78 degrees every day? And it, I, yes, I, I heard it. It's truth. It's the truth. It's the I, truth. I heard that. But all I meant, they hated that, man. But all I really meant that was, man, just, you know, it, it's so amazing out there. You know what I mean? It's beautiful and there's beautiful people everywhere. And it's like, just, just fucking, you know, just enjoy life for what it is instead of always chasing down bullshit. You know what I mean? If, uh, you know, what I mean? it's, it, it's just, you know, just care less about, uh, how many people like your shit, you know, just, you know, try to, you know, try, try someone else out. You know what I mean? And try, try, try to use your happiness, uh, you know, the, to, to do shit like that. You know what I mean? And I think you immediately see how much things change for, for, for you when you, when you care less a little about like other people and what they do and what they think. I think that it just yes. takes this, you know, this big, this big weight off your back. And, uh, you know, I'm, like I said, I've always been really lucky even from when I was a kid to just, you know, I never need, anything to do that i just kind of always never gave a fuck about and everyone says that everyone says they don't care but those are usually the ones who care the most you know what i mean it's like uh, yeah yeah i've always been they really want to not care i get the sentiment you want to not care but it's different saying it and really not caring it's funny earlier that you mentioned jeff bezos <laughs> thing that they always put uh when when uh when when full grappling puts pictures of me up uh all the people always talk shit and say it's Jeff Bezos because <laughs> you have the same haircut. No, I think, yeah, you know, I mean, the, the boys at the gym always laugh. Like I said, man, it, it's fun. I'm always, I love breaking balls anyway. I like when kind of like people talk shit and they're trying to have a good time. I think it's fun. And, uh, it's, it, you know, I don't know. It, it is what it is, dude. It's all, uh, do you not, maybe, do you not give your phone number out? Yeah, it's on. You can get it on. The, it's a six one eight seven three one two six four four. I get about to hold on. I'll show. I'll show you here. Just, just during our. So I, I get about two thousand text messages a day. Um, oh what? I don't, I don't know if you can see that on there on the messages right here. It's, oh. Uh, so just during our thing, I, I get a hundred and seventy-seven text. We we've been up like two, two hours or something. It's uh. So how does anyone contact you? I was wondering because most of my guests, yeah, that's insane. How does anyone contact you? So, uh, well, I mean, I, 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 and what happens is when I get home, I get done with my day. I usually sit down every, everybody in the, the family goes to bed and I'll usually take about two hours and try to go through messages. And I always try to reply to everyone always. But, uh, uh, Alejandro, uh, Viner, uh, W A J N E R that that's, uh, he actually runs the Pigo submission fighting Instagram. So I am extremely, extremely uh, appreciative and lucky to have him because he actually- Alejandro's the one that wears the shirt always open with the necklace? That's the guy. That's, that's him, yeah. He, he's, uh, 
he's the yeah that's him he's like looks like he's from brooklyn he's always got the gold chains on and he's uh, a sweetheart of a man what a sweetheart of a man yeah, he, he just said on, on our, our, our YouTube, the Pedigo Submission Fight on YouTube, uh, man, if people like the Daisy Fresh shows, literally almost once a week we put out something. They're literally like Daisy Fresh episodes, man. These, uh, you know, you can like the guys on there. It's completely free to obviously. And uh, they, uh, it, 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 it's it's really neat, man, to be able to just have where he had through the course and his, uh, when I met him, I had never really met, I had never uh, Alejandro before and uh they uh they he, he reached out to me and he, he was moving out to California and his wife had just uh they were on the wrestling team together and she had like slept with all the guys on the wrestling team that he was with and he'd constantly Ouch. like like take her back and then she would kind of like do the same thing and then it was like uh he was gonna his brother lives in California he was gonna run off and uh a guy had reached out to me in Mount Vernon uh that uh he he had told me, hey man, I I, I think I hooked up with this guy that, that you on your team. Uh, he he didn't train or anything. He was actually from my old neighborhood. I think I hooked up with his wife. I didn't want there to be any problems, and it was out. So I reached out to him to ask him about this, and he told me, man, my my wife cheated on me again. She's extremely religious from this very very religious family, and uh, he said, hey, I'm moving to uh, I'm moving out there, and I told him, hey, why don't you uh, the, the mother just walked in. <laughs> hey, the Alejandro, thank you for putting me in touch with Heath. I'm finding out how incredibly hard it is to get in touch with him. I feel so lucky now to have had yeah. almost three hours of his time. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, getting all the Heath Pedagogs has been uh, really tough. I, I, do, I do one of these. Uh, your camera's in there now. <laughs> so, uh, so George just got here. They just got done with practice, so they're excited. But uh, I do one of these about once every couple months, man. So I actually have the boys pick the, the – they think the fuck coolest guys are that are like don't they really give a shit about impressing anyone they're just doing it because they love it so they they picked you and i said yeah fuck it let's do that guys thing do you have any so, crossfitters in the bunch um if i did they would tell us all about it right the yeah well i was an executive at crossfit and, and and that's how i sort of know some of these names because the founder of crossfit was big in the jiu-jitsu scene greg glassman and that's how I met Garth Taylor. And the and you mentioned a guy before that Greg used to mention a lot. The guy who has that website, that message board, um, something the mat. Oh, yeah, Scotty. So uh, I do actually. I get those guys. I actually love the CrossFit guys because they're like so they're like the closest thing because you know everything's full body and they're like it's hard, man. So with uh, I was just kidding when they said anyone who does anything talks. Of course, I no, it's true. It's true. No, I'm, I'm just breaking balls, but uh, I actually break balls I away. I love when I get those guys because, man, they're so uh, they're they're game. Uh, they are. They're they're really game, and they're they're the feeling of you know that your chest is going to explode, and you got to be you know that humans are capable of so much, man. It's like we we can the, the, that governor that we have in our mind. It's like it's full job is to tell you, hey, uh, Savan, you got to chill out, bro. It's like you got to. You, you got to go, go easy, you know, like back up that, that, that's your brain's job is to like get you to not do shit that's too hard. It always wants you to be safe. Unfortunately, that's what keeps you from usually, you know, like being, uh, you know, great is that thing. So you've got to rip that fucking thing out, try to throw it away and just constantly push yourself And the crossfitters, man. They, uh, they, they're really good at that. So it's, a, I, I don't have to take the time usually when I get them as competitors to them that, Hey, you're not going to, you know what I mean? Your your heart's not going to blow up. They're kind of used to that feeling. So I'm actually when I get them, I'm I'm really glad. Appreciate man, they're fucking tough. So it's like, um, I I, I get them. And there's a kid from St. Louis that comes over that had competed in the cross games, and uh, he had done really good, man. And when he came in, he was just like, you know, he was just a monster, man. And I I wish he could have came to Mount Vernon full time, but he's a policeman actually over in St. Louis. Uh, but he, uh, man. Do you remember his name? Matt Green is his name. He's uh he 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 was a wrestler that wrestled for Lindenwood, and uh, he trains over in St. Louis. Great guy. He's he's done a, he's had a really incredible uh, uh he's just done really really well with, you know in his jujitsu and and wrestling life. And I think that's because a lot of his CrossFit stuff is like really 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 like you know kept him you know like you said man they're just game dude. It's uh it's a, that's a perfect word for them actually man. You know it's like they're always up for that dog fight. You know what I mean? That just like rough you know uh, uh they're hard to break so i wish i could get more of them 
if you know they're gonna sit on their ass and in my way. Dude, you're gonna have a pr you're gonna have a problem soon. You're gonna have too many people coming to you. Uh, you probably have that problem already. I've had three hours of your time, Heath, and I um, if you ever get a new phone number. I, I beg of you to share it with me. I promise I won't text you too much. I'm sort of afraid to get off the phone with you because I'm afraid it could be the last time I ever talk to you. No, I will continue to watch the Daisy Fresh and American Jiu-Jitsu Tale. I will continue to bug all of uh, your guys and try to get more of them on my show. Um, it's been an absolute honor. This is the longest podcast I've ever done. The good news is the last one I did that was two hours and 45 minutes was huge and exploded. So I think people will really like this one too. I don't think there's anything in that number. You, anyone can you, you can use that. I apply sometimes. It takes me a long time. It's 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 not just about jujitsu. You know what I mean? It's like I always like I said at the beginning of the pro, the podcast. I'm an activist in the jujitsu revolution. What that means? The jujitsu revolution. Jujitsu for everyone. You don't have to be connected to anyone. And uh, th 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 this is not in any way, shape, or form like an anti-Brazilian. Uh, I don't, I, that's not what I mean at all. You can be from anywhere, from any group of people, uh, and you can be successful. You know what I mean? Our team has proven that, you know, we don't have connection in major or people. It's just something that we built with hard work and like love and dedication. And that's what the Jiu Jitsu revolution is to me. And I think you can use that in all walks of life. You know what I mean? It's just that that's, that's the most important thing. So if there's anything ever that I can help anyone with. I don't can give a shit less if you do jujitsu or not. It doesn't matter. The Pedagogy Submission Fighting Instagram, Alejandro's on there. Anyone can contact me. I'll any anyone that I can help. I will always help in any way. I don't have much to give, but I'll give everything that I have to to always just trying to make you know the the the, the world a better place in the way that I'm able to do that. So uh, anything. I mean, I, I I'm glad. I love for people to contact. The boys love it, and they're always just – they're so excited, man, to just be a part of everybody's life. And through this, we've got to meet so many wonderful people, and it's just uh, – man, I'm just so proud of what we've built and being able to like, be, on, be on things like your show, man. It's just a – you know, it's a way to reach so many people we could never reach before. But uh, you know, the, the, the world's a great place, man. Isn't it so fun? Living is so fun. And it's easy to get down, man. It's easy to feel like it's not. And I just think that sometimes we need a reminder of that. And there's so many people out there that struggle the same way. And other, some people are just tougher than other people, man. You know, they're like <laughs> wired to, they're, they're wired to, to deal with just hard shit better than other people are. It's never your fault. You know, it's a, a, the same, like it's, it's okay to not be okay thing, you know, but dude, I think everyone goes through that at some point, you know what I mean? It's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's just so hard to deal with that. It, to deal with that shit sometimes and um man i just i hope that people will, will, will use the you know to, to use us if they need anything if there's any way we can help if someone wants i don't care if you do jujitsu or not anyone come out stay with us hang out with us the entire time just fucking get away from wherever you need to get away from that it's just use us use our, use our platform and there it, it's it's nothing you know no one's asking for anything it's just the, the the daisy fresh thing it's like the daisy fresh army man it's like people it, it, that it's just being a part of something that's just bigger than you and realizing there's so many people that are like you out there that uh sometimes man and it's uh you know you have good days you have bad days dude you just got to keep your chin up and fucking hang in there and be tough and everyone can do that you can do it it's just that you know just remember you're never alone you're never by yourself and even the people who are the best anything in the world these days too you know so please if anyone needs anything hit us up contact us we'll help in any way that we can like i said don't have a lot to offer but everything i have is available to everyone who needs it so that's it bam yeah